found an old bookmark for a bookstore that no longer exists. <laughs> the Defense, a novel by Vladimir Nabokov. Too fair. <laughs> okay. Forward. The Russian title of this novel is Zaschita Luzina, Luzina, which means the Luzian defense and refers to a chess defense supposedly invented by my creature, Grandmaster Luzian. The name r rhymes with illusion, if pronounced thickly enough to deepen the U into U. I began writing it in the spring of 1929 at Le Bolu, a small spa in the Pyrenees Orientalis, where I was hunting butterflies and finished it the same year in Berlin. I remember with special limpidity a sloping slab of rock in the Ulex and Ilex clad hills where the main thematic idea of the book first came to me. Some curious additional information might be given if I took myself more seriously. Zaschita Lugina, under my pen name V. Sirin, ran in the Emigre Russian Quarterly Solvermenier Zipisky, Paris, and immediately afterwards was brought out in book form by the Emigre Publishing House Slovo, Berlin, 1930. That paper bound edition, 234 pages, sorry, PP, 21 by 14 centimeters, jacket, a solid dull black with a gilt lettering, is now rare and may grow even rarer. Poor Lusion has had to wait 35 years for and English language edition. True, there's a promising flurry in the late 30s when an American publisher showed interest in it, but he turned out to belong to the type of publisher who dreams of becoming a male muse to his author, and our brief conjunction ended abruptly upon his suggesting I replace chess by music and make Lusion a demented violinist. Rereading this novel today, replaying the moves of its plot, I feel rather like an Anderson fondly recalling his sacrifice of both rooks to the unfortunate and noble Kirsitki, who is doomed to accept it over and over again through an infinity of textbooks with a question mark for monument. My story was difficult to compose, but I greatly enjoyed taking advantage of this or that image and scene to introduce a fatal pattern into Lucian's life and to endow the description of a garden, a journey a sequence of humdrum events, with the semblance of a game of skill, and especially in the final chapters with that of a regular chess attack, demolishing the innermost elements of the poor fellow's sanity. In this connection, I would like to spare the time and effort of hack reviewers, and generally persons who move their lips when reading and cannot be expected to tackle a dialogueless novel, when so much can be gleaned from its foreword, by drawing their attention to the first appearance of the frosted window theme associated with Lusian's suicide, or rather sui mate, as early as chapter 11, or to the pathetic way my morose grandmaster remembers his professional journeys not in terms of sunburst luggage labels and magic lantern slots, but in terms of the tiles in different hotel bathrooms and corridor toilets, that floor with the white and blue squares where he found and scanned from his throne imaginary continuations of the match game in progress, or a teasingly asymmetrical, commercially called a gate pattern with a night move of three arlequin colors interrupting here and there the neutral tint of the otherwise regularly checkered linoleum between Rodin's thinker, sorry, Rodin's thinker 
and the door or certain large glossy black and yellow rectangles whose H file was painfully cut off by the ochre vertical of the hot water pipe or that palatial water closet on whose lovely marble flags he recognized intact the shadowy figurations of the exact position he had brooded upon, chin on fist, one night many years ago. But the chess effects I planted are distinguishable not only... Hello. I hope you are doing well. I am about to start reading this right now. I am reading the forward of it. Oh. But the chess effects I planted are distinguishable not only in these separate scenes, their con concaten concatenation can be found in the basic structure of this attractive novel. Thus, toward the end of chapter four, an unexpected move is made by me in a corner of the board. Sixteen years elapse in the corner, sorry, in the course of one paragraph. And Lusion, suddenly promoted to seedy manhood and transferred to a German resort, is discovered at a garden table, pointing out with his cane and remembered hotel window, not the last glass square in his life, and talking to somebody, a woman, if we judge by the handbag on the iron table, whom we do not meet till chapter six. The retrospective theme begun in chapter 4 shades now into the image of Lucian's late father, whose own past is taken up in chapter 5 when he, in his turn, is perceived recalling his son's early chess career and stylizing it in his mind so as to make of it a sentimental tale for the young. We switch back to the Kerr house in chapter 6 and find Lucian still fiddling with the handbag and still addressing his blurry companion where... Upon she unblurs, takes away from him, mentions Lucian Senior's death, and becomes a distinct part of the design. The entire sequence of moves in these central chapters reminds one, or should remind one, of a certain type of chess problem, where the point is not merely the finding of a mate in so many moves, but what is termed retrograde analysis, the solver being required to prove from a back cast study of the diagram position that Black's last move could not have been castling, or must have been the capture of a white palm en passant. It is unnecessary to enlarge in this elementary forward in, on the more complex aspects of my chessmen and lines of play. But the following must be said. Of all my Russian books, the defense contains and diffuses the greatest warmth, which may seem odd seeing how supremely abstract chess is supposed to be. In point of fact, Lucian has been found lovable even by those who understand nothing about chess or detest all my other books. He is uncouth, unwashed, uncomely, but as my gentle young lady, a dear girl in her own right, so quickly notices, there is something in him that transcends both the coarseness of his gray flesh and the sterility of his recondite genius. In the prefaces I have been writing of late for the English language editions of my Russian novels, and there are more to come, I made it a rule to address a few words of encouragement to the Viennese delegation. The present board shall not be an exception. Analysis and analyze will enjoy, I hope, certain details of the treatment Lucian is subjected to after his breakdown, such as the curative insinuation that a chess player sees mom in his queen and pop in his opponent's king, and the little Freudian who mistakes Pixlock set for the key to a novel will no doubt continue to identify my characters with his comic book notion of my parents, sweethearts, and serial selves. For the benefit of such sleuths, I may as well confess that I gave Lucian my, French gov Lucian, my French governess, my pocket chess set, my sweet temper, and the stone of the peach I plucked in my own walled garden. 
Vladimir Nabokov, Montreux, December 15, 1963. December 15th is my birthday, but not 1963. I never noticed that. Okay. The defense. Um, yes, before I go on, I should say, um, I, someone in the past taught me how to play chess, but I still, <laughs> still, uh, couldn't quite grasp a lot of of it, so I'm I'm really not any good at playing, but I still enjoy this book. So as someone who doesn't even, I don't even play, like I don't, I don't remember how certain things are supposed to move. Um, like it was, it just went way over my head, and, uh, it's just the way that I am, I, I find chess to be so confusing and difficult, but that doesn't mean that this is not an enjoyable book, like it said in the foreword, it, I found this to be a very, very good book, I loved this book, um, except there are some sad moments, some stressful moments, but it's still a good book. Okay. One. What struck him most was the fact that from Monday on, he would be Lucian. His father, the real Lucian, the elderly Lucian, the writer of books, left the nursery with a smile rubbing his hands already smeared for the night with transparent cold cream, and with his suede-slippered evening gait padded back to his bedroom. His wife lay in bed. She half-raised herself and said, Well, how did it go? He removed his gray dressing gown and replied, We managed. Took it calmly. Oof. That's a real weight off my shoulders. How nice, said his wife, slowly drawing the silk blanket over her. Thank goodness, thank goodness. It was indeed a relief. The whole summer, a swift country summer, consisting in the main of three smells, lilac, new-mown hay, and dry leaves. The whole summer they had debated on the question of when and how to tell him, and they had kept putting it off, so that it dragged on until the end of August. They had moved around him in apprehensively narrowing circles, but he had only to raise his head and his father would already be rapping with feigned interest on the barometer dial where the hand always stood at storm, while his mother would sail away somewhere into the depths of the house, leaving all the doors open and forgetting the long, messy bunch of bluebells, oh, sorry, bluebells, on the lid of the piano. The stout French governess who used to read the Count of Monte Cristo aloud to him and interrupt her reading in order to exclaim feelingly, poor, poor Dante's, proposed to the parents that she herself take the bull by the horns, though this bull inspired mortal fear in her. Poor, poor Dante's did not arouse any sympathy in him, and observing her educational sigh, he merely slitted his eyes and riveted Rived his drawing paper with an eraser, and he tried to portray her protuberant bust as horribly as possible. Many years later, in an unexpected year of lucidity and enchantment, it was with swooning delight that he recalled these hours of reading on the veranda, buoyed up by the south of the garden. The recollection was saturated with sunshine and the sweet, inky taste of the sticks of licorice, bits of which she used to hack off with the blows of her penknife and persuade him to hold under his tongue, and the tacks he had once placed on the wickerwork seat destined with crisp, crackling sounds to receive her obese croup, were in retrospect equivalent with the sunshine and the sounds of the garden, 
and the mosquito fastening onto his skinned knee and blissfully raising its rubescent abdomen. A ten-year-old boy knows his knees well, in detail. The itchy swelling that had been scrabbled till it bled, the white traces of fingernails on the sun-tanned skin, and all those scratches which are the appended signatures of sand grains, pebbles, and sharp twigs. The mosquito would fly away, evading a slap. The governess would request him not to fidget, in a frenzy of concentration, bearing his uneven teeth, which a dentist in St. Petersburg had braced with platinum wire, and bending his head with its elicid crown, he scratched and scraped at the bitten place with all five fingers, and slowly, with growing horror, the governess stretched toward the opening drawing book, toward the unbelievable caricature. No, I'd better tell him myself, replied Lucian Sr., uncertainly to her suggestion. I'll tell him later. Let him write his dictations in peace. Being born in this world is hardly to be born. Lucian Sr. dictated steadily, strolling back and forth about the schoolroom. Being born in this world is hardly to be born. And his son wrote, practically lying on the table and baring his teeth in their metallic scaffolding, and simply left blanks for the words born and born. Arithmetic went better. There was mysterious sweetness in the fact that a long number arrived at with difficulty would at the decisive moment... Oh! Okay, so he he didn't write down born or born, which would make the sentence instead of being born in this world is hardly to be born means being in this world is hardly to be. Oh, as far as I know, he wasn't um, religious. I don't, I don't think he actually adhered to a religion. Um, so, where was I? And he didn't like, um, what is it? he didn't like psychology either. Like he, he didn't like the way that people, um, relied on the things that psychologists said to rule their lives. Um, anyway, he was... He was always um, writing things that would kind of make a sort of mockery of psychology. Oh, where was I? Arithmetic went better. There was a mysterious sweetness in the fact that a long number arrived at with difficulty would at the decisive moment after many adventures be divided by 19 without any remainder. He was afraid, Lucian Sr., that when his son learned why the founders of Russia, the completely featureless, sinuous, and truer, were necessary, as well as the table of Russian words taking the letter Yat and the principal rivers of Russia, the child would go into the same tantrum as had happened two years before, when slowly and heavily, to the sound of creaking stairs, crackling floorboards, and shifting trunks, filling the whole house with her presence, the French governess had first appeared. But nothing of the kind occurred now. He listened calmly, and when his father, trying to pick out the most interesting and attractive details, said, among other things, that he would be called by his surname, as grown-ups are called, the son blushed, began to blink, 
threw himself supine on his pillow, opening his mouth and rolling his head. Don't squirm like that, said his father apprehensively, noting his confusion and expecting tears. but did not break into tears and instead buried his face in the pillow, making bursting sounds with his lips into it and suddenly rising, crumpled, warm, with glistening eyes, he asked rapidly whether at home, too, they would call him Lujan. And now on this dull, tense day, on the way to the station to catch the St. Petersburg train, Lujan Sr., sitting next to his wife in the open carriage, looked at his son and was ready to smile immediately if the latter should turn his stubbornly averted face toward him and wondered what had caused the boy suddenly to become so stiffish, as his wife expressed it. He sat opposite them on the front seat, wrapped in a dark wool woolen tweed coat, wearing a sailor cap, which was set askew but which no one on earth would have dared to straighten now, and looked aside at the thick birch trunks spinning past along a ditch that was full of their leaves. "'Aren't you cold?' asked his mother when the road turned toward the river and a gust of wind set up a downy ripple in the gray bird's wing of her hat. "'Yes, I am,' said her son, looking at the river. His mo mother, with a mewing sound, was about to reach out and arrange his cloak, but noticing the look in his eye, she swiftly snatched her hand back and merely indicated with a twiddle of her fingers in midair, close it up, close it tighter. The boy did not stir, parsing her lips to unstick her voilette from her mouth. A constant gesture, almost a tick, she looked at her husband with a silent request for support. He was also wearing a woolen cloak. His hands, encased in thick gloves, rested on a plaid traveling rug which sloped down gently to form a valley and then slightly rose again as far as the waist of little Luzin. Luzin. Luzin, said his father with forced jollity. Eh, Luzin? And tenderly nudged his son with the leg beneath the rug. Luzin withdrew his knees. Here came the peasant log cabins, their roofs thickly overgrown with bright moss, here comes the familiar old signpost with its half-erased inscription, the name of the village and the number of its souls. And here comes the village well with its bucket, black mud, and a white-legged peasant woman. Beyond the village, the horses climbed the hill at a walk, and behind them, below, appeared the second carriage in which, sitting squeezed together, came the governess and the housekeeper, who hated one another. The driver smacked his lips and the horses again broke into a trot. In the colorless sky, a crow flew slowly over the stubble. The station was about a mile and a half from the manor at a point where the road, after passing smoothly and resonantly through a fir wood, cut across the St. Petersburg Highway and flowed farther across the rails beneath a barrier and into the unknown. If you like, you can work the puppets, said Lucian Sr. ingratiatingly when his son jumped out of the carriage and fixed his eyes on the ground, moving his neck, which the wool of his cloak irritated. He silently took the proffered tin copic coin. The governess and the housekeeper crawled ponderously out of the second carriage, one to the right and the other to the left. Father took off his gloves. Mother disengaging her veil, kept an eye on the barrel-chested porter who was gathering up their traveling rugs. A sudden wind raised the horse's manes and dilated the driver's crimson sleeves. Finding himself alone on the station platform, Lucian walked toward the glass case where five little dolls where pendant bare legs awaited the impact of a coin in order to come alive and revolve. But today their expectation was in vain, for the machine turned out to be broken and the coin was wasted. Lucian waited a while and then turned and walked to the edge of the tracks. To the right, a small girl sat on an enormous bale, eating a green apple, her elbow propped on her palm. To the left stood a man in gaiters with a riding stick in his hand, looking at the distant fringe of the forest, whence in a few moments would appear the train's harbinger a puff of white smoke. In front of him, on the other side of the tracks, beside a tony 
second class car without wheels that had taken root in the ground and turned into a permanent human dwelling. A peasant was shopping firewood. Suddenly, all this was obscured by a mist of tears. His eyelids bur burned. It was impossible to bear what was about to happen. Father with a fan of tickets in his hand. Hands. Mother counting her their baggage with her eyes, the train rushing in, the porter placing the steps against the car platform to make it easier to mount. He looked around. The little girl was eating her apple. The man and gators were staring into the distance. Everything was calm. As if on a stroll, he walked to the end of the station platform and then began to move very fast. He ran down some stairs, and there was a beaten footpath. The station master's garden, a fence, a wicked gate, fir trees, then a small ravine, and immediately after that, a dense wood. At first he ran straight through the wood, brushing against swishing ferns and slipping on a reddish lily of the valley leaves, and his cap hung at the back of his neck, held only by its elastic, his knees were hot in the woolen stockings already donned for city wear. He cried while running, lisping childish curses when a twig caught him across the forehead, and finally he came to a halt, and panting, squatted down on his haunches so that the cloak covered his legs. Only today, on the day of their annual move from the country to city, on a day which in itself was never sweet, when the house was full of drafts and you envied so much the gardener who was not going anywhere, only today did he realize the full horror of the change that his father had spoken of. Former autumn returns to the city. Now seemed happiness. His daily morning walks with the governess, always along the same streets, along the Nevsky and back home, by way of the embankment, would never be repeated. Happy walks. Sometimes she had suggested to him they begin with the embankment. But he had always refused, not so much because he had liked the habitual from earliest childhood as became he was unbearably afraid of the cannon at the Peter and Paul Fortress, of the huge thunder-like percussion that made the window panes in the houses rattle and was capable of bursting one's eardrum, and he always contrived by means of imperceptible maneuvers to be on the Nevsky at twelve o'clock, as far as possible, from the cannon, whose shot, if he had changed the order of his walk, would have overtaken him right by the Winter Palace. Finished also were his agreeable after-lunch musings on the sofa, beneath the tiger rug, and at the stroke of two, his milk in a silver cup, giving it such a precious taste, and at the stroke of three, a turn in the open lundo. In exchange for all this came something new, unknown, and therefore hideous, an impossible, unacceptable world, where there would be five lessons from nine to three and a crowd of boys still more frightening than those who just recently, on a July day, here in the country, right on the bridge, had surrounded him, aimed tin pistols at him, and fired at him with stick-like projectiles, whose rubber suction cups had perfidiously been pulled off. The wood was still and damp. Having cried his fill, he played for a while with a beetle nervously moving his feelers, and then had quite a time crushing it beneath the stone as he tried to repeat the initial juicy scrunch. Presently, he noticed that it had begun to drizzle. Then he got up from the ground, found a familiar footpath, and stumbling over roots, started to run with vague, vengeful thoughts of getting back to the manor. He would hide there. He would spend the winter there, subsisting on cheese and jam from the pantry. The footpath meandered for ten minutes or so through the wood, descended to the river, which was all covered with circles from the raindrops, and five minutes later there hove into sight the sawmill, its footbridge where you sank in up to the ankles in sawdust, and the path upward, and then through the bare lilac bushes, the house. He crept along the wall, saw that the drawing room window was open, climbed up by the drain pipe into the garden, sorry, onto the green, peeling cornice and rolled over the windowsill. Once inside the drawing room, he stopped and listened. A dog or a type of his maternal grandfather, black side whiskers, violin in hand, stared down at him, but then completely vanished, dissolving in the glass. As soon as he regarded the portrait from one side, 
a melancholy amusement that he never omitted when he entered the drawing room. Having thought for a moment and moved his upper lip, which caused the platinum wire on his front teeth to travel freely up and down, he cautiously opened the door, wincing at the sound of the vibrant echo, which had too hastily occupied the house upon the departure of its owners, and then darted along the corridor and thence up the stairs into the attic. The attic was a special one, with a small window through which one could look down at the staircase, at the brown gleam of its balustrade that curved gracefully lower down and vanished in the penumbra. The house was absolutely quiet. A little later, from downstairs from his father's study, came the muffled ring of a telephone. The ringing continued with intervals for quite a while. Then again there was silence. He settled himself on a box. Next to it was a similar case, but open and with books in it. A lady's bicycle, the green net of its rear wheel torn, stood on its head in the corner between an unplanned board propped against the wall and an enormous trunk. After a few minutes, Lucian grew bored, as when one's throat is wrapped in flannel and one is forbidden to go out. He touched the gray, dusty books in the open box, leaving black imprints on them. Besides books, there was a shuttercock with one feather, a large photograph of a military band, a cracked chessboard, and some other not very interesting things. In this way, an hour went by. Suddenly, he heard the noises, the noise of voices and the whine of the front door. Taking a cautious look through the little window, he saw below his father, who, like a young boy, ran up the stairs and then, before reaching the landing, descended swiftly again, throwing his knees out on either side. The voices below were now clear, the butlers, the coachmen's, the watchmen's. A minute later, the staircase again came to life. This time, his mother came quickly up it, hitching up her skirt, but she also stopped short of the landing, leaning instead over the balustrade, and then swiftly, with arms spread out, she went down again. Finally, after another minute had passed, they all went up in a posse. His father's bald head glistened, the bird on mother's hat swayed like a duck on a troubled pond, and the butler's gray crew cut bobbed up and down at the rear. Leaning at every moment over the balustrade came the coachman, the watchman, and for some reason the milkmaid Aquilina, and finally a black-bearded peasant from the water mill, future inhabitant of future nightmares. It was he, as the strongest, who carried Lucian down from the attic to the carriage. Oops. No. Okay, I I can just do that. I'm going to read some of the things that were said here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 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 um He was first published under pseudonyms, if I remember correctly. Um, um, and...
Anyway. Oh. Oh, that would be fun. That would actually be a lot of fun. Let me come right back. Mm, I don't know. Where I go? Oh my gosh. Okay. I do have this by J.M. Barry, What Every Woman Knows, Unabridged. So, this is one. This is one of uh, his plays. He did some one act plays that were terrific. I used to go to a library and um, check out J.M. Barry. Like anytime I would look up in the library system, if there were any kind of um, J.M. Barry one act plays in, in like a one act play anthology, I would check out that anthology and um, look for the one act plays in there because Peter Pan was not his only play. Um, he had several one-act plays that were so good, and yet most people know him for Peter Pan. Um, I could read this at some point, although this is really dark. It's like one of the darkest things that I actually have. <laughs> darkest books. Um, it's not intended to be... I don't really feel like it's really... It says James Clavell's The Children's Story, but not just for children, but I don't feel like this should ever have been for children. That's kind of like the point. Um, so.
So it's kind of a scary book, but in a way. Um, but there's this, this is kind of like a play, sort of. It's very short. I was attracted to this because of its strange title and everything. I was like, what is this? When I saw this at a used bookstore and I had to get it. I'm glad I did, but it was very weird. The Monkey's Paw. Excellent, excellent. Short one-act play that I love. Classic one-act play. I can read that. Um, this one-act play the Lady or the Tiger, which um, inspired the poem that I have in my uh, collection, The Lady is the Tiger. So there's this. So yeah, I could read some one-act plays. This or this. Or what every woman knows at some point. Um, I like random humor for the most part. Like flash animation type humor. Like you saw maybe when I was um, streaming one time and I showed Charlie the Unicorn. Uh, oh, I love Dad's humor. Like, when I first started watching the Dad videos, at first I thought because of the music that it was like poppy, but then it, it became so funny so fast that I, um, I just love it. It's it's got it's got its own thing. It's it's very unique. And uh Anyway. Joe Orton's stage scripts from the 60s. I can write that down. Um, I really like one-act plays because they tend to be they tend to have something about them which It forces the the people who write the one act plays to be more more creative with how they use dialogue and more creative with how they um, how they choose to present a scene in such a way where it won't get boring for people to just see one scene for the whole play. And I feel like that's also something that could be said for short stories. So, like, the same way that that um, one-act plays force the writer to focus on certain aspects to bring more emphasis in certain areas and keep the, uh, um, the attention, um, so do short stories. Short stories are, are a great challenge. And I, I also would read the other one act plays in those books, and I just I absolutely love them. Um, Salome is one of my favorites, actually, by Oscar Wilde. And yet, <laughs> I'm not sure if I should finish that sentence. 
I don't want to compare Salome to Dorian Gray because it just, it doesn't feel like it was written by the same person. Hmm. I love dad dancing. Are you kidding? Dad dancing is amazing. Hmm. It did not romanticize it, and that's the thing that I always try to help people see is that it never romanticized what the subject matter was. Never. You were supposed to see, this is a book about a crazy man, and this is a look inside crazy man's mind and the way that he sees things, and you never get to see the point of view of any of the other characters. These are just his own perceptions. So you have to read it from that frame of mind of, taking a step back, like, how much of this is really happening and how much of it happens in the crazy man's mind? And how did it really happen versus how did, how he described it? What really happened? And so sometimes you have to read it and think about the way that he describes people's behavior toward him and people's sort of reactions to him. One of the most telling moments in the book for me is um, one of the nurses when she makes fun of his French. She says that he, she basically says he can't speak French that well. And throughout the book, he is, like, so prideful about that. Like, he's always throwing French into things. Yeah, it kind of is like that. Um, like walking into an established argument when you read one act plays. But that's also something I like about J.D. Salinger. When you open up a book by J.D. Salinger, it feels like you're taken immediately into whatever is happening, and it's just so cool. Oh, yes, Dad is amazing. <laughs> So you saw that in Discord, the thing about the wedding. Um, so Nathan has decided that he is marrying all of us. We are all married. We're, we're married to Nathan. <laughs> that happened last night. Um. It's, it's funny. It's, it's great. <laughs> what? <laughs> Um, he's, he's marrying, he's married all the, he's marrying everyone in the Discord. <laughs> like, if you go into the Discord, you are automatically married to Nathan, apparently. <laughs> it's hilarious, anyway. 
so I should go back to reading. Two, Lucian Sr., the Lucian who wrote books, often thought of how his son would turn out. Through his books, and they all except for a forgotten novel called Fumes, were written for boys, youths, and high school students, and came in sturdy, colorful colors, covers. There constantly flitted the image of a fair-haired lad, headstrong, brooding, who later turned into a violinist or a painter without losing his moral beauty in the process. The barely perceptible peculiarity that distinguished his son from all those children who, in his opinion, were destined to become completely unremarkable people, given that such people exist, he interpreted as the secret stir of talent and bearing firmly in mind the fact that his deceased father-in-law had been a composer, albeit a somewhat arid one, and susceptible in his mature years to the doubtful splendors of virtuosity, he more than once in a pleasant dream resembling a lithograph descended with a candle at night to the drawing room where a wunderkind dressed in a white nightshirt that came down to his heels would be playing on an enormous black piano. It seemed to him that everybody ought to see how exceptional his son was. It seemed to him that strangers, perhaps, could make better sense of it than he himself. The school he had selected for his son was particularly famous for the attention it paid to the so-called inner life of its pupils and for its humanness, thoughtfulness, and friendly insight. Tradition had it that during the early part of its existence, the teachers had played with the boys during the long recess. The physics master, looking over his shoulder, would squeeze a lump of snow into a ball, the mathematics master would get a hard little ball in the ribs as he made a run in Latta, Russian baseball, and even the headmaster himself would be there cheering the game on with jolly ejaculations. Such games in common no longer took place, but the idyllic fame had remained. His son's classmaster was the Russian literature teacher, a good acquaintance of Lucian, the writer and incidentally not a bad lyric poet who had put out a collection of imitations of Anacreon. Drop in, he had said on the day when Lucian first brought his son to school. Any Thursday around 12, Lucian dropped in. The stairs were deserted and quiet. Passing through the hall to the staff room, he heard a muffled, multivocal roar of laughter coming from class two. In the ensuing silence, his steps rang out with a stressed sonority on the yellow parquetry of the long hall in the staff room at a large table covered with bays, which remained one of examinations. The teacher sat writing a letter. Since the time of his son's entrance to the school, he had not spoken to the teacher, and now, visiting him a month later, he was full of titillating expectation of a certain anxiety and timidity of all those feelings he had once experienced as a youth in his university uniform when he went to see the editor of a literary review to whom he had shortly before sent his first story. And now, just as then, instead of the words of delighted amazement he had vaguely expected, as when you wake up in a strange town expecting with your eyes still shut an extraordinary blazing morning, Instead of all those words which he himself would so willingly have provided, had it not been for the hope that nonetheless they would eventually come, he heard chilly and dull phrases that proved the teacher understood his son even less than he did. On the subject of any kind of hidden talent, not a single word was uttered, inclining his pale bearded face with two pink grooves on either side of his nose, from which he carefully removed his tenacious pince nez and rubbing his eyes with his palm, the teacher began to speak first saying that the boy might do better than he did, that the boy seemed not to get on much with his companions, that the boy did not run about much during the recess period. The boy undoubtedly has ability, said the teacher, concluding his eye-rubbing, but we notice a certain listlessness. At this moment, a bell was generated somewhere downstairs and then bounded upstairs and passed unbearably shrilly throughout the whole building. 
After this, there were two or three seconds of the most complete silence, and suddenly everything came to life and burst into noise. Desk lids banged, and the hall was filled with talking and the stamp of feet. The long recess, said the teacher. If you like, we'll go down to the yard, and you can watch the boys at play. These descended the stone stairs swiftly, hugging the balustrade and sliding the soles of their sandals over the step rims, well polished by use. Okay, I'm going to pause there. Um, it's... It's sad to me that... I mean, obviously, he wants the best things for his son, but he is trying, it feels like, to push different um, sort of passions on his son. Like, maybe you'll be this, maybe you'll be that. Um, and that's like Panin. If you remember in Panin how he, um, he thought that his son would like a football. But when he gave his son that, his son was not interested in sports. And he gave like a long um, discussion on sports and his son told him he didn't care about sports. Um, so it's sad to me how, you know, he goes into the office, this father goes into the office, and so far, his son has apparently not found something yet that he clicked with. But, I mean, he is still growing at this point in the story. I should read. <laughs> it was funny. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty much what this book is kind of about. <laughs> no, no, my microphone wasn't working. I told you that, the microphone wasn't working. Um... Yeah, so what happened yesterday was I was trying to play a song and I forgot that when you unplug the USB microphone, which by the way, it's green right now. If you can see this, it's green. It's plugged in, it's working. Anyway, um, I forgot that when you unplug the USB mic, it doesn't just switch over to the laptop inbuilt mic. It just stops. So I was doing that because I thought that if I played the song through my computer that you could hear it because I can hear it when I unplug the USB mic, whereas if I leave the USB mic in then I have to plug in um, some kind of um, earbuds to listen and I don't think you would be able to hear it. I think I would be the only one to hear it but I don't know how that works. So I um I unplugged the USB mic and instantly I couldn't couldn't pick up any of the like I would I would try to make the um the sound come back and it wouldn't like I I tried looking around YouTube studio and there's there's nothing um, so, uh, it was later, later on that I saw that was happening in Discord.
and it was funny. I didn't say what was happening in Discord. I did say something was happening probably in Discord, but I I didn't say what, and that was what was happening. <laughs> well, if you get into Nathan's Discord, you'll be married to Nathan too, because we're all married to Nathan now. <laughs> Funny things happen sometimes in his Discord like that. I mean, this is this is just one one example of <laughs> um last year for Valentine's Day, he did a stream where he he bought all these roses and anytime somebody would I don't know if it was when somebody would like comment in the chat and he would see it or something but he would be like this rose is for you and then he would like present the rose like here's the rose for you and like he would do that occasionally throughout that stream like giving people roses so this is probably something along those lines like <laughs> anyway, where was I? <laughs> It is February, by the way. Happy February. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, have you read my books? Do you know what my books are about? I mean, there are often couples with some age gaps in my books. Yeah, Valentine's Day is just around the corner. So no wonder he has decided we're all married to him. <laughs> Hello, Raphael. Oh, no, why would I? No. I don't know where I was on the page, so I'm just going to read the first sentence. Balustrade and sliding the soles of their sandals over the step rims, well polished by use. Downstairs, amid the crowded darkness of coat racks, they changed their shoes. Some of them sat on the broad window sills, grunting as they hastily tied their shoelaces. Suddenly, he caught sight of his son, who, all hunched up, was disgustedly taking his boots from a cloth bag. A hurrying, tow-haired boy bumped into him, and moving aside, Lucian suddenly caught sight of his father. The latter smiled at him, holding his tall, Astrakhan shapka and implanting the necessary furrow on top with the edge of one hand. Lucian narrowed his eyes and turned away as if he had not seen his father. Squatting on the floor with his back to his father, he busied himself with his boots. Those who had already managed to change stepped over him, 
and after every push, he hunched himself up still more as if hiding in the dark nook. When at last he went out, wearing a long gray overcoat and a little astrakhan cap, which was constantly being tipped off by one and the same burly boy, his father was already standing at the gate at the other end of the yard and looking expectantly in his direction. Next to Lujan Sr. stood the literature teacher, and when the large gray rudder ball the boys used for soccer happened to roll up to his feet, the literature teacher, instinctively continuing that enchanting tradition, made as if he wanted to kick it, but only shifted awkwardly from foot to foot and almost lost one of his galoshes and laughed with great good humor. The father supported him by the elbow, and Lucian Jr., grasping the opportunity, returned to the vestibule, where all was now quiet and where the janitor, concealed by clothes racks, was heard yawning blissfully. Through the glass of the door between the cast iron rays of the star-shaped grill, he saw his father suddenly remove his glove, quickly take leave of the teacher, and disappear through the gate. Only then did he creep out again, and carefully skirting the players, make his way to the left, where firewood was stacked under the archway. There, raising his collar, he sat down on a pile of logs. In this way, he sat, though, through approximately 250 long intermissions until the year that he was taken abroad. Sometimes the teacher would suddenly appear from around a corner. Why are you always sitting in a heap, Lucian? You should run about a bit with the other boys. Lucian would get up from the wood pile, trying to find a point equidistant from those three of his classmates who were especially fierce at this hour, shy away from the ball propelled by someone's resounding kick and having reassured himself that the teacher was far off, would return to the wood pile. He had chosen this spot on the very first day, on that dark day, when he had discovered such hatred and derisive curiosity around him that his eyes had automatically filled with a burning mist and everything he looked at, out of the accursed necessity of looking at something, was subject to intricate optical metamorphosis. The page with crisscross blue lines grew blurry, the white numbers on the blackboard alternately contracted and broadened, the arithmetic teacher's voice, as if steadily receding, would get more and more hollow and incomprehensible, and his desk neighbor, an insidious brute with down on his cheeks, would say with quiet satisfaction, Now he's going to cry. But Lucian never once cried, not even in the laboratory when they made a concerted effort to thrust his head into the low bowl with yellow bubbles in it. Gentlemen, the teacher had said at one of the first lessons, your new comrade is the son of a writer, whom if you haven't read him, you should proceed to read. And in large letters he wrote on the board, pressing so hard that the chalk was pulverized crunchingly beneath his fingers. Tony's Adventures, Silvestrov and co-publishers, during two or three months after that, his classmates called him Tony. With a mysterious air, the downy-cheeked brute bought the book to class, and during the lesson stealthily showed it to the others, casting significant glances at his victim. And when the lesson was over, began to read aloud from the middle, purposefully mangling the words. Petrichev, who was looking over his shoulder, wanted to hold back a page, and it tore. Krebs gabbled. My dad says he's a very second-rate writer. Gromov shouted. Let Tony read to us, clown of the cast. Sorry. Let Tony read to us aloud. Better to give everybody a piece each, said the clown of the class with gusto, and took possession of the handsome red and gold book after a stormy struggle. Pages were scattered over the whole classroom. One of them had a picture on it, a bright-eyed schoolboy on a street corner feeding his lunch into a scruffy dog. The following day, Lucian found this picture neatly tacked onto the underside of his desk lid. Soon, however, they left him in peace, only his nickname flared up from time to time, but since he stubbornly refused to answer it, that, too, finally died down. They stopped taking any notice of Lucian and did not speak to him, and even the sole quiet boy in the class, the sort there is in every class, just as there are 
Invariably, a fat boy, a strong boy, and a wit steered clear of him, afraid of sharing his despicable condition. This same quiet boy who, six years later, in the beginning of World War I, received the St. George Cross for an extraordinarily dangerous reconnaissance and later lost an arm in the Civil War, when trying to recall in the twenties of the present century what Lucian had been like in school, could not visualize him otherwise than from the rear, either sitting in front of him in class with protruding ears or else receding to one end of the hall as far away as possible from the hubbub, or else departing for home in a sleigh cab, hands in pockets, a large piebald satchel on his back, snow falling. He tried to run ahead and look at Lucian's face, but that special snow of oblivion, abundant and soundless snow, covered his recollection with an opaque, opaque white mist. And the former quiet boy, now a restless imagery, said as he looked at a picture in the newspaper, Imagine, I just can't remember his face. Just can't remember. But Lucian Sr., peering through the window around four o'clock, would see the approaching sleigh and his son's face like a pale spot. The boy usually came straight to his study, kissed the air as he touched his father's cheek with his and immediately turned away. Wait, his father would say. Wait, tell me how it was today. Were you called to the blackboard? He would look greedily at his son, who turned his face away and would want to take him by the shoulders, shake him, and kiss him soundly on his pale cheek, on the eyes, on his tender, concave temple. From anemic little Lucian, that first school winter came a touching smell of garlic as a result of the arsenic injections prescribed dirt. What? What? Why would that happen? I don't understand. Does anyone know why that would happen? Arsenic injections? His platinum band had been removed, but he continued to bare his teeth and curl his upper lip out of habit. He wore a gray Norfolk jacket with a strap at the back and knickerbockers with buttons below the knee. He would stand by the desk balancing on one leg, and his father did not dare to do anything against his impenetrable sullenness. Little Lucian would go away, trailing his satchel over the carpet. Lucian Sr. would lean his elbow on the desk where he was writing one of his usual stories in blue exercise books, a whim which perhaps some future biographer would appreciate, and listen to the monologue in the neighboring dining room to his wife's voice persuading silence to drink a cup of cocoa. I'm sorry. Um... <laughs> I'm sorry.
<laughs> what? I'm sending you this link. I guess. Or maybe not. I don't. Why on earth? Why? Okay, no, that didn't help at all. That didn't even explain anything. I guess we could just say they were stupid. Yeah, we can just write it off as stupidity in people in, in the medicine world at some point, giving children arsenic. Let's go on. A frightening silence, thought Lucian Sr. He's not well. He has a painful inner life of some sort. Perhaps he shouldn't have been sent to school. <laughs> but on the other hand, he has got to get used to being with other lads. An enigma. An enigma. Well, take some cake, then, the voice behind the wall would continue sorrowfully and again silence, but sometimes something horrible occurred. Suddenly, for no apparent reason at all, another voice would reply, strident and hoarse, with the door would slam as if shut by a hurricane. Then Lucian Sr. would jump up and make for the dining room, holding his pen like a dart. With trembling hands, his wife would be setting aright an overturned cup and saucer and trying to see if there were any cracks. I was asking him about school, she would say, not looking at her husband. He didn't want to answer, and then, like a madman, they would both listen. The French governess had left that autumn for Paris, and now nobody knew what he did there in his room. The wallpaper there was white, and higher up was a blue band on which were drawn gray geese and ginger puppies. A goose advanced on a pup, and so on, 38 times around the entire room. So, repeating wallpaper again. Uh, no, I have no idea. What do you mean? Um, I didn't see comments. I was looking at something online, trying to figure out why on earth that would have ever been a treatment for anything. There was something saying it could have been a treatment for depression at some point in time, but that seems really disturbing as a depression treatment, especially for a child. Hmm, I don't understand it. So, let me, let me, uh, let me bookmark this again, and I will, I will go back to reading. I will uh, read some things that were said here. No, she's only his manager for um, the boxing, which means she's probably just going to be there um, kind of as a way of like advertising when he's in the boxing ring for Creator Clash. So she's not his manager manager, only for boxing.
I've never done an audiobook, but um, but I did do a dramatic reading of Pet Names and Disco's when I adapted that to animation, I did all of the voices for Disco's. I did most of the voices for Keep the Change, the movie. Um, and I have read aloud all of Miriam's journal books in a live stream. And I now have a playlist on my YouTube of readings where I have read books or have done something having to do with reading books. Because the pet named dramatic reading was also kind of visual in a way because mm, I was being in character when I read it. So I had different outfits that I wore just for the pet named three part reading. No, but we're talking about a child, a child going to school, being injected with arsenic. That's really, really disturbing. No, I wouldn't. I would never do that to anybody. I've never read Morrissey's autobiography. Oh my goodness. Ooh. heart diseases. So, are you saying, are you saying that because the boy's um, disinterest in sports, maybe they, they thought that he was tired when he would sit down and not play? So they gave him an arsenic thing to make it where he Hmm. No, I... Huh? Uh, I don't... I feel like I've lost what was happening in the chat. And I don't know what's happening in the chat now. Mm. <laughs> it just really bothered me that that would be something that would be used on children. I should continue reading. I'm sorry. I got very disturbed by that. Very, very disturbed. And it had nothing to do with you. I promise. I, I didn't even know what was going on there.
A goose advanced on a pup and so 38 times around the entire room. The tabouret supported a globe and a stuffed squirrel bought once on Palm Sunday at the Catkin Fair. A green clockwork locomotive peeped out from beneath the flounces of an armchair. I thought that the boy in the secret garden was just pretending that he was ill because he just didn't want to play outside. And that he actually could get better if he wanted to, but I don't remember it that well. It was like he had lost his muscles because he wasn't playing outside. He was sullen and depressed and he just didn't care to to walk or anything. But I didn't know if it had anything to do with his parents. Although honestly that should that should have something to do with the parents. If they're not trying to get him to do some form of exercise. <sighs> okay. <laughs> well, see, the thing about books is that there's always, especially when books are written about a time before this, there are going to be historical elements in all books, even if they are... The weird thing is there are going to be historical elements in all books, even if they are set in the future, because even the future will have things about it that come from things that happened before in the past. So there's always going to be a little bit of history involved. So I don't think that he would make up something like this. That's, that's a detail I don't think he would because um, there are all kinds of weird weird treatments in time in the past they were really disturbing like if you if you watch the movie mesmer which is a fantastic movie but i shouldn't even really go on that topic because that'll take that'll take this in a completely different direction it'll like very much sidetrack me if i even talk about the movie mesmer so i'm not going to go too far talking about mesmer but if you watch that movie um that also covers some medicinal treatments back then that were barbaric Hmm. Yeah, I I know. Uh, there was some sort of bizarre thing about apple seeds, and I don't remember if it was like she she fed apple seeds to her husband or something. I don't know. <laughs> oh, wow. That's interesting. I never would have heard of something like that, although I would think that would not work. But I guess if people don't know any better, they might 
take all kinds of unnecessary risks. Um, Interesting you say that. There were horrible things that happened in American history when it comes to um, poisons, too. Um, to this day, actually, different parts of the world, uh, there are poisonous ingredients. But the U.S. is more lax about certain ingredients being in food than even the rest of the world. <sighs> in fact, I have a book um, that I downloaded to my um, to my library. Uh, once that is all about poisons in food through history, and it's called Swindled, and it's actually a very terrifying read. Uh, but I don't know why that stuff is fascinating. It's scary, but it's fascinating sometimes. Uh, and then I also read that people used to poison chocolates and then send poisoned chocolates to people that they wanted dead. That was a thing people once did. It's absolutely horrifying. I need to stop talking about this. <laughs> but it's pretty horrifying. The things that happen in history that are like, they don't sound real, but were. So, yeah. Yeah, that's true. I know. It's really creepy. <laughs> I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't understand how a culture can be so I just don't get it. It's hard to even imagine that. And that's history. That's the thing. Like, history is just full of the most insane things. Anyway. I would never do that. Um. I wouldn't say that. Uh, it's just. The past. And we can try to learn from it. And. Anyway, so I'm going to keep reading. I 
A green clockwork locomotive peeped out from beneath the flounces of an armchair. It was a nice, bright room. Gay wallpaper, gay objects. There were also books. Books written by his father with red and gold embossed bindings and a handwritten inscription on the first page. I earnestly hope that my son will always treat animals and people the same way as Tony. And a big exclamation mark. Or, I wrote this book thinking of your future, my son. These inscriptions inspired him in him a vague feeling of shame for his father, and the books themselves were as boring as Korolinko's, Korolinko's The Blind Musician, or Goncharov's The Frigate Palace. A large volume of Pushkin with a picture of a thick-lipped, curly-haired boy on it was never opened. On the other hand, there were two books, both given him by his aunt, who followed in love for his whole life, holding them in his memory as if under a magnifying glass and experiencing them so intensely that twenty years later, when he read them over again, he saw only a dryish paraphrase an abridged edition, as if they had been outdistanced by the unrepeatable, immortal image that he had retained. But it was not a thirst for distance, peregrinations that forced him to allow on the, to follow on the heels of Phileas Fogg, nor was it boyish inclination for mysterious adventures that drew him to that house on Baker Street, where the lanky detective with the hawk profile having given himself an injection of cocaine. <laughs> Another injection of a bad thing. Oh. Would dreamily play the violin. Only much later did he clarify in his own mind what it was that had thrilled him so about these books. It was that exact and relentlessly unfolding pattern. Phileas, the dummy in the top hat, wrenching his complex, elegant way with its justifiable sacrifices, now on an elephant bought for a million, now on a ship of which half was to be burned for fuel, and Sherlock endowing logic with the glamour of a daydream, Sherlock composing a monograph on the ash of all known sorts of cigars, and with this ash as with a talisman progressing through a crystal labyrinth of possible deductions to the one radiant conclusion. The conjurer whom his parents engaged to perform on Christmas Day somehow managed to blend in himself briefly both Fogg and Holmes, and the strange pleasure which Lucian experienced on that day obliterated all the unpleasantness that accompanied the performance. Since requests, cautious, infrequent requests, to invite your school friends never led to anything, Lucian Sr., confident that it would be both enjoyable and useful, got in touch with two acquaintances whose children attended the same school, and he also invited the children of a distant relative, two quite flabby, quiet, flabby little boys and a pale little girl with a thick braid of black hair. All the boys invited wore sailor suits and smelled of hair oil. Two of them Lucian recognized with horror as Bernisnev and Rosen from class three, who at school were always dressed sloppily and behaved violently. Well, here we are, said Lucian Sr., joyfully holding his son by the shoulder, the shoulder slowly sliding out from under his hand. Now I'll leave you alone. Get to know one another and play for a while, and later you'll be called, and we have a surprise for you. Half an hour later, he went to call them. In the room, there was silence. The little girl was sitting in a corner and leafing through the supplement to the review, Neva, the cornfield, looking for pictures. Bersenev and Rosen were self-consciously sitting on the sofa, both very red and shiny with pomade. The flabby nephews wandered around in the room, examining without interest the English woodcuts on the walls, the globe, the squirrel, and a long-since broken pedometer lying on a table. Lucian himself, also wearing a sailor suit, with a whistle on a white cord on his chest, was sitting in, on a hard chair by the window, glowering and biting his thumbnail. But the conjurer made up for everything, and even when on the following day, 
Bersenev and Rosen, by this time again their real disgusting selves, came up to him in the school hall and bowed low, afterwards breaking into vulgar guffaws of laughter and quickly departing arm in arm and swaying from side to side. Even then, this mockery was unable to break the spell. Upon his sullen requests, whatever he said nowadays, his brows came painfully together. His mother brought him from the bazaar, a large box painted a mahogany color and a book of tricks with a bemetalled gentleman in evening dress on the cover, lifting a rabbit by its ears. Inside the box were smaller boxes with false bottoms, a wand covered with starry paper, a pack of crude cards where the picture cards were half jacks or half kings, and half sheep in uniforms. A folding top hat with compartments, a rope with two wooden gadgets on the ends, whose function was unclear, and there were also coquettish little envelopes containing powders for tinting water blue, green, and red. The book was much more entertaining, and Lucian had no difficulty in learning several card tricks, which he spent hours showing to himself before the mirror. He found a mysterious pleasure, a vague promise of still unfathomed delights in the crafty and accurate way a trick would come out. But still there was something missing. He could not grasp that secret which the conjurer had evidently mastered in order to be able to pluck a rouble out of the air or extract the seven of clubs, tacitly chosen by the audi audience, from the ear of an embarrassed Rosen. The complicated accessories described in the book irritated him. The secret for which he strove was simplicity, harmonious simplicity, which can amaze one far more than the most intricate magic. Okay. A moment. Just going to check really quick what is being said. <laughs> Oh no, I'm very anti that. I'm I don't wanna I would never harm anybody on purpose. And like I it would feel terrible. It would hurt me to hurt anybody, so no. No, she she tends to have this weird thing where when she swallows any kind of liquid, she... I don't know if it's like a stress thing, but she will, um... She tends to... To choke on liquids a little bit. Like how it is if you, like you know how if you have like anxiety and you um, you try to swallow with the anxiety and instead your saliva goes to the windpipe? That happens with her, except it can be coffee, water, Pepsi. Oh, I know you. I know that. I know that it's joking. Um. <laughs> She's all right. <laughs> I can tell when it's just that. I can also tell when she's nauseated. Um. There's a different sound when she coughs and she's nauseated, and I worry about when she gets nauseated because she 
doesn't have a gallbladder. And I remember when she had to have her gallbladder removed. And it, anyway, never mind. She's all right. It's just plates make a noise sometimes. <laughs> anyway, she's okay. In the written report on his progress that was sent at Christmas in this extremely detailed report where under the rubric of general remarks they spoke at length, pleonastically, of his lethargy, apathy, sleepiness, and sluggishness, and where marks were replaced by epithets, there turned out to be one unsatisfactory in Russian language and several barely satisfactories, among other things, in mathematics. However, it was just at this time that he had become extraordinarily engrossed in a collection of problems entitled Merry Mathematics, in the fantastical misbehavior of numbers and the wayward frolics of geometric lines in everything that the school book lacked. He experienced both bliss and horror in contemplating the way an inclined line rotating spoke-like slid upwards along another vertical one in an example illustrating the mysteries of parallelism. The vertical one was infinite, like all lines, and the inclined one also infinite, sliding along it and rising ever higher as, it, as its angle decreased, was doomed to eternal motion, for it was impossible for it to slip off, and the point of their intersection together with his soul glided upwards along an endless path, but with the aid of a ruler he forced them to unlock. He simply redrew them parallel to one another, and this gave him the feeling that out there in infinity, where he had forced the inclined line to jump off, an unthinkable catastrophe had taken place, an inexplicable miracle, and he lingered long in those heavens where earthly lines go out of their mind. Sorry. Um, maybe I, sometimes when you read books by him, there are sort of, um, mirrors of my block off and uh, so um Um, I'm not sure whether to say it, but, um, this feels like a precursor to, um, but it might not be a precursor. Um, the author had dreams 
that um, would later sometimes happen. And I have a book um, that is his dream journal. Um, it was called Insomniac Dreams. I plan on reading that at some point. Um, some of his dreams would make it into his writing, but some dreams really happened later. And I'm not sure if I should say. <laughs> There's there's something about the defense which I don't want to say, um, having to do with the ending of this. Um, because if I'm to say it now, it is a spoiler. Uh, but what it just had happen in that page, in that paragraph, was a spoiler. But I wouldn't have caught that the first time reading it. This is only my second time reading it because the ending. Anyway, um, well, see, the connection is same author, and sometimes there are true connections between his books, his life, and dreams that he had. <laughs> so I will go on. For a while he found an illusory relief in jigsaw puzzles. At first they were simple, childish ones, consisting of large pieces cut out with rounded teeth at the edges like Petit Beurre cookies, I don't know how to pronounce that, with interlocked so tenaciously that it was possible to lift whole sections of the puzzle without breaking them. But that year, there came from England the fad of jigsaw puzzles invented for adults, poozles as they called them, at the best toy shop in St. Petersburg, which were cut out with extraordinary, extraordinary ingenuity. Pieces of all shapes, from a simple disc, part of a future blue sky, to the most intricate forms, rich in corners, capes, isthmuses, cunning projections, which did not allow you to tell where they were supposed to fit, whether they were to fill up the piebald hide of a cow, already almost completed, or whether this dark border on a green background was the shadow of the crook of a shepherd, whose ear and part of whose head were plainly visible on a more outspoken piece. And when a cow's haunt gradually appeared on the left and on the right against some foliage, a hand with a shepherd's pipe, and when the empty space above became built up with heavenly blue and the blue disc fitted smoothly into the sky, Lucian felt wonderfully stirred by the precise combinations of these very colored pieces, that formed at the last moment an intelligible picture. Some of these brain twisters were very expensive and consisted of several thousand pieces. They were brought by his young aunt, a gay, tender, red-haired aunt, and he would spend hours bent over a card table in the drawing room, measuring with his eyes each projection before trying if it would fit into this or that gap and attempting to determine by scarcely perceptible signs the essence of the picture in advance. From the next room, full of the noise of guests, Dant would plead, For goodness sake, don't lose any of the pieces. Sometimes his father would come in, look at the puzzle, and stretch out a hand tableward, saying, Look, this undoubtedly goes in here. And then Lucian, without looking round, would mutter, Rubbish, rubbish, don't interfere. And his father would cautiously apply his lips to the tuft top of his son's head and depart, past the gilded chair's past the vast mirror, past the reproduction of Fern taking her bath, past the piano, a large silent piano shod with thick glass and 
caparisoned with a brocaded cloth. Okay, I started... I started laughing a little bit because I was remembering there was one time... Um, There was one time that I had a friend who visited me and we were we were doing like a large puzzle and at one point my friend said that he would have to be going after the puzzle and I <laughs> I started, like, more slowly <laughs> helping. <laughs> because I didn't want... Didn't want my friend to leave too soon. And I was already sad. <laughs> anyway. Hmm. It's, uh, okay, sometimes there are riddles in his books, so it may be, it may be a purposeful, um, misnaming of something that actually exists. Somebody take. It's... Oh. <laughs> Three. Only in April, I'm reading these, um, these books. I'm, I'm not, um, the only kind of censoring that I do, if there is a curse word, I'll just spell it. Um, there are some words that I just have no idea how to pronounce, and so when I have no idea how to pronounce it, I just sometimes won't attempt to. Um, but I'm not going to curse. <laughs> no, I'm not chatting my Alexa. Okay, three. Only in April during <laughs> Easter holidays. <laughs> Did that inevitable day come for illusion when the whole world suddenly went dark as if someone had thrown a switch and in the darkness only one thing remained brilliantly lit a newborn wonder a dazzling islet on which his whole life was destined to be concentrated the happiness on to which he fastened came to stay that april day froze forever while somewhere else the movement of seasons, the city spring, the country summer, continued in a different plane, dim currents which barely affected him. It began innocently, on the anniversary of his father-in-law's death, 
Lucian Sr. organized a musical evening in his apartment. He himself had little understanding of music. He nourished a secret, shameful passion for La Traviata, and at concerts listened to the piano only at the beginning, after which he contented himself with watching the pianist's hands reflected in the black varnish. But willy-nilly, he had to organize that musical evening at which works of his late father-in-law would be played, as it was the newspapers had been silent for too long. The oblivion was complete, laden, hopeless, and his wife kept repeating with a tremulous smile that it was all intrigue, intrigue, intrigue. That even during his lifetime, Others had envied her father's genius, and that now they wanted to suppress his posthumous fame. Wearing a black, open-necked dress and a superb diamond dog collar with a permanent expression of drowsy amiability on her puffy white face, she received the guests quietly without exclaiming, whispering to each a few rapid, soft-sounding words, but inwardly she was beset by shyness and kept looking about for her husband who was moving back and forth while mincing, with mincing steps, his starched shirt front swelling curious-like out of his waistcoat, a genial, discreet gentleman in the first timid throes of literary venerability. Stark naked again, sighed the editor of an art magazine, taking a passing look at Fearn, who is particularly vivid as a result of the intensified light. At this point, Lucian cropped up under his feet and had his head stroked. The boy recoiled. How huge he's grown, said a woman's voice from behind. He hid behind someone's tails. No, I beg your pardon, thundered out above his head. Such demands must not be made on our press. Not at all huge, but on the contrary, very small for his ears, he wandered among the guests trying to find a quiet spot. Sometimes somebody caught him by the shoulder and asked idiotic questions. The drawing room looked especially crowded because of the gilded chairs which had been placed in rows. Someone carefully came through the door carrying a music stand. By imperceptible stages, Lucian made his way to his father's study, where it was dark and settled on a divan in the corner. From the distant drawing room, through two rooms, came the tender wail of a violin. He listened sleepily, clasping his knees and looking at a chink of lacy light between the loosely closed curtains, through which a gas lamp from the street shone lilac-tinged white. From time to time, a faint glimmer sped over the ceiling in a mysterious arc, and a gleaming dot showed on the desk. He did not know what, perhaps one facet of a paperweight in the guise of a heavy crystal egg or a reflection in the glass of a desk photograph. He had almost dozed off when suddenly he started at the ringing of a telephone on the desk, and it became immediately clear that the gleaming dot was on the telephone support. <laughs> the butler came in from the dining room, turned on in passing a light which illuminated only the desk, placed the receiver to his ear, and without noticing, Lucian went out again, having carefully laid the receiver on the leather-bound blotter. A minute later, he returned accompanying a gentleman who, as soon as he entered the circle of light, picked up the receiver from the desk and with his other hand, groped for the back of the desk chair. The servant closed the door behind him, cutting off the distant ripple of music. Hello, said the gentleman. Lucian looked at him out of the darkness, fearing to move and embarrassed by the fact that a complete stranger was reclining so comfortably at his father's desk. No, I've already played, he said, looking upwards, while his white, restless hand fidgeted with something on the desk. A cab clip-clopped hollowly over the wooden pavement. I think so, said the gentleman. Lucian could not, sorry, Lucian could see his profile, an ivory nose, black hair, a bushy eyebrow. Frankly, I don't know why you are calling me here, he said quietly, continuing to fiddle with something on the desk. If it was only to check up, you silly. He laughed and commenced to swing one foot in its patent leather shoe regularly back and forth. Then he placed the receiver very skillfully between his ear and his shoulder and replying intermittently with yes and no and perhaps used both hands to pick up the object he had been playing with on the desk. 
It was a polished box that had been presented to his father a few days before. Lucian Jr. had still not a chance to look inside, and now he watched the gentleman's hands with curiosity. But the latter did not open the box immediately. Me too, he said. Many times, many times. Good night, little girl. Having hung up the receiver, he sighed on the box. However, he turned in such a way that Lucian could see nothing from behind his black shoulder. Lucian moved cautiously, but a cushion slid onto the floor, and the gentleman quickly looked around. What are you doing here? he asked, spying Lucian in the dark corner. My, my, how bad it is to eavesdrop. Lucian remained silent. What's your name? asked the gentleman amiably. Lucian slid off the divan and came closer. A number of carved figures lay closely packed in the box. Excellent chessmen, said the gentleman. Does Papa play? I don't know, said Lucian. And do you play yourself? Lucian shook his head. That's a pity. You should learn. At ten, I was already a good player. How old are you? Carefully, the door was opened. Lucian Sr. came in on tiptoe. He had been prepared to find the violinist still talking on the telephone and had thought to whisper very tactfully, Continue, continue, but when you finish, the audience would very much like to hear something more. Continue, continue, he said mechanically and was brought up short upon seeing his son. No, no, I've already finished, replied the violinist, getting up. Excellent chessman, do you play? Indifferently, said Lucian Sr., what are you doing here? You two come and listen to the music. What a game, what a game, said the violinist, tenderly closing the box. Combinations like melodies. You know, I can simply hear the moves. In my opinion, one needs great mathematical skill for chess, said Lucian Sr. And in that respect, I... They are awaiting you, maestro. I would rather have a game, laughed the violinist as he left the room. The game of the gods, infinite possibilities. A very ancient invention, said Lucian Sr., and looked around at his son. What's the matter? Come with us. But before reaching the drawing room, Lucian contrived to tarry in the dining room, where the table was laid with refreshments. There he took a plate full of sandwiches and carried it away to his room. He ate while he undressed and then ate in bed. He had already put the light out when his mother looked in bed and bent over at him. The diamonds around her neck glinting in the half light. He pretended to be asleep. She went away and was a long, long time so as not to make a noise, closing the door. He woke up next day with a feeling of incomprehensible excitement. The April morning was bright and windy and wooden street pavements had a violet sheen. Above the street near Palace Arch was an enormous red, blue, white flag, swelled elastically, the sky showing through it in three different tints, mauve, indigo, and pale blue. As always on holidays, he went for a walk with his father, but these were not the former walks of his childhood. The midday cannon no longer frightened him, and his father's conversation was unbearable. For finding a pretext in last night's concert, he kept hinting that it would be a good idea to take up music. For lunch, there was the remains of the Pachelle cream cheese, now a squat little cone with a grayish shading on its round summit, and a still untouched Easter cake. His aunt, the same sweet copper-haired aunt, second cousin to his mother, was gay in the extreme, threw cake crumbs across the table and related that for 25 rubles, Matham was going to give her a ride in his Antoinette monoplane, which, by the way, was unable to leave the ground for the fifth day, while Voisin, sorry, Voisin, on the contrary, kept circling the aerodrome, aerodrome like clockwork, and moreover, so low that when he banked over the stands, one could even see the cotton wool in the pilot's ears. Lucian, for some reason, remembered that morning and that lunch with unusual brightness. The way you remember the day preceding a long journey. His father said it would be a good idea after lunch 
to drive to the islands beyond the Neva, where the clearings were carpeted with anemones. And while he was speaking, the young aunt landed a crumb right in father's mouth. Mother remained silent. Suddenly, after the second course, she got up, trying to conceal her face, twitching with restrained tears, and repeating under her breath, It's nothing, nothing. It'll pass in a moment, hastily left the dining room. Father threw his napkin on the table and followed her. Lucian never discovered exactly what had happened, but passing along the corridor with his aunt, he heard subdued sobs from his mother's room and his father's voice remonstrating and loudly repeating the phrase, imagining things. Let's go away somewhere, whispered his aunt in an embarrassed and nervous manner, and they entered the study where a band of sunbeams, in which spun tiny particles of dust, was focused on an overstuffed armchair. She lit a cigarette and folds of smoke started to sway, soft and transparent, in the sunbeams. This was the only person in whose presence he did not feel constrained, and now it was especially pleasant, a strange silence in the house, and a kind of expectation of something. Well, let's play some game, said his aunt hurriedly, and took him by the neck from behind. What a thin little neck you have. One can clasp it with one hand. Do you know how to play chess? asked Luzin, Luzin stealthily, and freeing his head, he rubbed his cheek against the delightful bright blue silk of her sleeve. A game of snap would be better, she said absent-mindedly. A door banged somewhere. She winced and turned her face in the direction of the noise, listening. No, I want to play chess, said Luzin. It's complicated, my dear. You can't learn it in an instant. He went to the desk and found the box, which was standing behind a desk photograph. His aunt got up to take an ashtray, ruminatively crooning in conclusion of some thought of hers. That would be terrible. That would be terrible. Here, said Lucian, and put the box down on a low, inlaid Turkish table. You need the board as well, she said. And you know, it would be better for me to teach you checkers. It's simpler. No, Jess, said Lucian, and unrolled an oilcloth board. First, let's place the pieces correctly, began his aunt with a sigh. White here, black over there, king and queen next to each other. These here are the officers. These are the horses, and these at each corner are the cannons. Now, suddenly she froze, holding a piece in midair and looking at the door. Wait, she said anxiously. I think I left my handkerchief in the dining room. I'll be right back. She opened the door but returned immediately. Let it go, she said, and again sat down. No, don't set them all without me. You'll do it the wrong way. This is called a palm. Now watch how they all move. The horse gallops, of course. Lucian sat on the carpet with his shoulder against her knee and watched her hand with its thin platinum bracelet, picking up the chessmen and putting them down. The queen is the most mobile. He said with satisfaction and adjusted the piece with his finger since it was standing not quite in the center of the square. And this is how one piece eats another, said his aunt, as if pushing it out and taking its place. The pawns do this obliquely. When you can take the king, but he can move out of the way, it's called check. And when he's got nowhere to go, it's mate. So your object is to take my king, and I have to take yours. You see how long it all takes to explain? Perhaps we can play another time, eh? No. Now, said Lucian, and suddenly kissed her hand. That was sweet of you, said his aunt softly. I never expected such tenderness. You are a nice little boy after all. Please let's play, said Lucian, and moving in a kneeling position on the carpet, reached the low table. But at that moment, she got up from her seat so abruptly that she brushed the board with her skirt and knocked off several pieces. In the doorway stood his father. Go to your room, he said, glancing briefly at his son. 
Lucian, who was being sent out of a room for the first time in his life, remained as he was on his knees out of sheer astonishment. Did you hear? said his father. Lucian flushed and began to look for the fallen pieces on the carpet. Hurry up, said his father in a thunderous voice such as he had never used before. His aunt hastily began to put the pieces any which way into their box. Her hands trembled. One pawn just would not go in. Now take it, take it, she said. He slowly rolled up the oilcloth board, and his face darkened by a sense of deep injury, took the box. He was unable to close the door behind him, since both hands were full. His father took a swift stride and slammed the door so hard that Lucian dropped the board, which immediately unfolded. He had to put the box down and roll up the thing again. Behind the door of the study, there was at first silence, then the creak of an armchair under his father's weight, and then his aunt's breathless interrogative whisper. Lucian reflected disgustedly that today everyone had gone mad and went to his room. There he immediately set out the pieces as his aunt had shown him, and considered them for a long time trying to figure something out, after which he put them away very neatly in their box. From that day the chess set remained with him, and it was a long time before his father noticed its absence. From that day there was in his room a fascinating and mysterious toy, the use of which he had still not learned. From that day his aunt never again came to visit them. What do you mean, different? Commenting. <laughs> <laughs> it was just a funny. <laughs> you can be married too if you if you go to his Discord. <laughs> It's just something funny. Um, I take it, and I don't remember if there are any other, um, mentions, like, hinting back at what just happened, but I think... I think that <laughs> I think the violinist set off this this kind of thing uh like maybe the violinist was actually um Maybe he was somehow an enemy of his father, for whatever reason. Um, or, I don't know why that didn't catch 
I didn't catch that. Okay, so maybe the violinist is actually Lucian's real father. Because... I, I think maybe the violinist is Lucian's father. And that's why... <laughs> that would explain why everyone is upset. Because, obviously, there is no reason for, um... No reason otherwise that his mother would just, like, run off from the table and start crying. I mean, at first you almost think, wait, is the mother jealous of the aunt? And that would be weird. Or Or is the violinist actually Lucian's father, and that's why he's so upset that um, that Lucian was attracted to the chessboard. Uh, the references are because this is about a this is about Lucian who becomes a great chess player, and then chess um, becomes such a great obsession that, never mind, I'm not spoiling the book for you. <laughs> it's about a character who is obsessed with chess. And I'll just stop at that. <laughs> I shouldn't, I shouldn't spoil the book for you. Yeah. Um, there are some interesting ways in which this book is referencing things, um, but it's all on purpose. Um, the author loved chess, too. Yeah, kind of. Oh, that would make sense then. Yeah, that would make sense then because you could see like if the boy's mother is jealous of the aunt, that would make sense for her to run crying out of the room. Yeah. And then the kind of shame of him pushing all these different hobbies on his son only for the one hobby that his son likes to be chess. No, I don't feel like that. I don't feel like he was hated by everyone in the house. They loved him. They wanted him to be happy. They wanted to find some hobby for him to be interested in. But his real father was the violinist. Mm hmm. That's why the ant, <laughs> that makes sense, because that would be why the ant would no longer be part of the story. The ant never came back again. So the ant is now gone. The violinist also gone.
Yeah. He mentioned that in the forward about um, the the people being like pieces. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to continue to read. A week or so later, an empty gap occurred between the first and third lesson. The geography teacher had caught a cold. <laughs> When five minutes had passed after the bell and still no one had come in, there ensued such a premonition of happiness that it seemed the heart would not hold out should the glass door nonetheless now open and the geography teacher, as was his habit, come dashing almost at a run into the room. Only Lucian was indifferent. But low over his desk, he was sharpening a pencil, trying to make the point as sharp as a pin. An excited din swelled around him. Our bliss, it seemed, was bound to be realized. Sometimes, however, there were unbearable disappointments. In place of the sick teacher, the predatory little mathematics teacher would come creeping into the room, and having closed the door soundlessly, would begin to select pieces of chalk from the ledge beneath the blackboard with an evil smile on his face. But a full ten minutes elapsed and no one appeared. The din grew louder. From an excess of happiness, somebody banged a desk lid. The class tutor sprang up out of nowhere. Absolute quiet, he said. I want absolute quiet. Valentin Ivanovic is sick. Sorry, Ivanovich is sick. Occupy yourselves with something. But there must be absolute quiet. He went away. Large fluffy clouds shone outside the window. Something gurgled and dripped. Sparrows chirped. Blissful hour. Bewitching hour. Lucian apathetically began to sharpen yet another pencil. Gromov was telling some story in a hoarse voice, pronouncing strange, obscene words with gusto. Petrushev begged everyone to explain to him how we know that they are equal to two right-angled ones. And suddenly, behind him, Lucian distinctly heard a special sound, wooden and radley, that caused him to grow hot and his heart to skip a beat. Cautiously, he turned around. Krebs and the only quiet boy in class were nimbly setting out light little chessmen on a six-inch board. The board was on the desk, but was on the desk bench between them. They sat extremely com extremely uncomfortably sideways. Mujin, forgetting to finish sharpening his pencil, went up to them. The players took no notice of him. The quiet boy, when trying many years later to remember his schoolmate Lujan, never recalled that casual chess game played during an empty hour. Mixing up dates he extracted from the path a vague impression of Lucian's once winning a school match. Something itched in his memory, but he could not get at it. There goes the tower, said Krebs. Lucian following his hand, thinking with a tremor of momentary panic that his aunt had not told him the names of all the pieces. But tower turned out to be a synonym for cannon. 
I didn't see you could take, that's all, said the other. All right, take your move back, said Krebs. With gnawing envy and irritating frustration, Lucian watched the game, striving to perceive those harmonious patterns the musician had spoken of, and feeling vaguely that in some way or other he understood the game better than these two, although he was completely ignorant of how it should be conducted. Why this was good, and that was bad, and what one should do to penetrate the opposite king's camp without losses. And there was one kind of move that pleased him very much, amusing in its sleekness. Krebs king slid up to the piece he called a tower, and the tower jumped over the king. Then he saw the other king come out from behind its pawns, one had been knocked out like a tooth, and begin to step distractedly back and forth. Check, said Krebs, check, and the stung king leaped to one side. You can't go here, and you can't go here either. Check, I'm taking your queen. Check. At this point, he lost a piece himself and began insisting he should replay his move. The class bully flipped Lucian on the back of the head and simultaneously with his other hand knocked the board onto the floor. For the second time in his life, Lucian noticed how unstable a thing chess was. And the following morning, while still lying in bed, he made an unprecedented decision. He usually went to school in a cab and always made a careful study of the cab's number, dividing it up in a special way in order the better to store it away in his memory. Extract it, thence whole should he require it. But today he did not go as far as school and forgotten his excitement to memorize the number. Fearfully glancing around, he got out at Caravanaya Street, and by a circular route, avoiding the region of the school, reached Sergeyevskaya Street. On the way up, he happened to run into the geography teacher, who with enormous strides, a briefcase under his arm, was rushing in the direction of the school, blowing his nose and expectorating phlegm as he went. Lucian turned aside so abruptly that a mysterious object rattled heavily in his satchel. Only when the teacher, like a blind wind, had swept past him did Lucian become aware that he was standing before a hairdresser's window and that the frizzled heads of three waxen ladies with pink nostrils were staring directly at him. He took a deep breath and swiftly walked along the wet sidewalk, unconsciously trying to adjust his steps so that his heel always landed on a joint between two paving slabs. But the slabs were all of different widths. And this hampered his walk. Then he stepped down onto the pavement in order to escape temptation and sloshed on in the mud along the edge of the sidewalk. Finally, he caught sight of the house he wanted plum colored, with a naked old men straining to hold up a balcony and stained glass in the front door. He turned in at the gate past a spur stone showing the white marks of pigeons, stole across an inner court where two individuals with rolled up sleeves were washing a dazzling carriage, went up a staircase and rang the bell. She's still asleep, said the maid, looking at him with a surprise. Wait here, won't you? I'll let Madame know in a while. Lucian shrugged off his satchel in business-like fashion and laid it beside him on the table, which also bore a porcelain inkwell, a blotting case embroidered with beads, and an unfamiliar picture of his father, a book in one hand, a finger of the other pressed to his temple. And from nothing better to do, he commented to count the different hues in the carpet. He had been in his room only once before, last Christmas, when on his father's advice he had taken his aunt a large box of chocolates, half of which he had himself eaten and the remainder of which he had arranged so that it would not be noticed. Up until just recently, his aunt had been at their place every day, but now she had stopped coming and there was something in the air, some elusive interdiction that prevented him from asking about it at home. Having counted up to nine different 
shades, he shifted his gaze to a silk screen embroidered with rushes and storks. He had just begun to wonder whether similar storks were on the other side as well when at last his aunt came in. Her hair not yet done and wearing a kind of flowery kimono with sleeves like wings. Where did you spring from? she exclaimed. And what about school? Oh, what a funny boy you are. Two hours later, he again emerged onto the street. His satchel, now empty, was so light that it bounced on his shoulder blades. He had to pass time somehow until the usual hour of return. He wandered into Tavernchesky Park, and the emptiness in his satchel gradually began to annoy him. In the first place, the thing he had left as a precaution with his aunt might somehow get lost before the next time, and in the second place, it would have come in handy at home during the evenings. He resolved to act differently in the future. Okay, I'm going to continue. Where was I? Family circumstances, he replied the next day when the teacher casually inquired why he had not been in school. On Thursday, he left school early and missed three days in a row, explaining afterwards that he had a sore throat. On Wednesday, he had a relapse. On Saturday, he was late for the first lesson, even though he had left home earlier than usual. On Sunday, he amazed his mother by announcing that he had been invited to a friend's house, and he was away five hours. On Wednesday, school broke up early. It was one of those wonderful blue, dusty days at the very end of April, when the end of the school term is already imminent, and such indolence overcomes one. But he did not get home until much later than usual, and then there was a whole week of absence, a rapturous, intoxicating week. The teacher telephoned his home to find out what was the matter with him. His father answered the phone. When Lucian returned home around four o'clock in the afternoon, his father's face was gray, his eyes bulging, while his mother gasped as if deprived of her tongue, and then began to laugh unnaturally and hysterically with wails and cries. After a moment's confusion, father led him without a word into his study, and there, with arms folded across his chest, requested an explanation. Lucian, holding the heavy and precious satchel under his arm, stared at the floor, wondering whether his aunt was capable of betrayal. Kindly give me an explanation, repeated his father. She was incapable of betrayal, and in any case, how could she know he had been caught? You refuse? asked his father. Besides, she somehow seemed even to like his truancy. Now listen, said his father, conciliatorily. Let's talk as friends. Lucian sighed and sat on the arm of a chair, continuing to look at the floor. As friends, repeated his father more soothingly. So now it turns out you have missed school several times. So now I would like to know where you have been and what you have been doing. I can even understand that, for instance, the weather is fine and one gets the urge to go for walks. Yes, I get the urge, said Lucian indifferently, growing bored. His father wanted to know where exactly he had gone for a walk and whether his need of walks was long-standing. Then he reminded him that every man has his duty as a citizen, as family man, as soldier, and also as schoolboy. Lucian yawned. Go to your room, said his father hopelessly, and when his, father, sorry, when his son had left, he stood for a long time in the middle of his study and looked at the door in blank horror. His wife, who had been listening for the next room, came in, 
sat on the edge of the divan and again burst into tears. He cheats, she kept repeating. Just as you cheat, I'm surrounded by cheats. He merely shrugged his shoulders and thought how sad life was, how difficult to do one's duty, not to meet anymore, not to telephone, not to go where he was irresistibly drawn. And now this trouble with his son, this oddity, this stubbornness, a sad state of affairs, a very sad state. Um, the whole thing with the violinist and the, um, and his father and then the thing with the, the aunt and his mother also is very reminiscent of, um, Ada or Ardor, um, the way it is with Aqua, Marina, who are sisters, but they both ended up dating brothers, one of them black-haired, the other one um, red-haired, um, They ended up marrying, um, it's just, it's a very strange, complicated thing, but it's, it's very, very similar to this. That's what I'm thinking of with the whole thing with the violinist and the, it's very interesting how very similar that is. Thank you. Um. I feel like I should go get some water. It's now on the 54th page. Um. <laughs> the violinist was deprived of his own son. That's how I feel like Unless I'm wrong, it just seems like Lucian was deprived of his father. His father deprived of his own son. Um, and like the thing that could have made it whole ended up just being like another um <laughs> uh i don't know i just feel like it's sad honestly um i'm going to turn on the heater i'm going to get some water I guess in a way kind of very Freudian, but it's like very mismatched. Especially since if she's saying that everyone cheats, but she has a son with with a violinist, that would mean that she cheated. Oh, I can't do that. I've been having, like, stomach pain ever since I had that hot lemon water. I think I need to continue to have bland food and bland water. <laughs> so. Hmm. So I'm probably going to have some plain water 
And maybe some simple toast. Nothing on it. And I'll come back. Of course, actually, I have had tea lately too. Sometimes after I have tea, if it's I don't know. Sometimes tea bothers my my stomach too lately, and I don't I don't really understand it. So I'm just going to uh, have something bland, and I will be back. The feeling's kind of like, um, it's kind of like eating something sour. Like that kind of thing where it's like a stinging feeling in your stomach, like you're hungry, but it's, it's like a really painful thing. So... Um, ever since, and I think maybe it could just be that I didn't dilute the lemon water enough. It may have been way too strong. I may not have added enough water to lemon. And, um, it's not all the time. It's just every now and then. So I've been eating blandly to try and help that. I'll come back.
It's not the right toast. This is toast. Just toast. Mm. <laughs> you can probably hear that. Hmm. One time I went on a rant about toast in Nathan's Discord. Sometimes I just love certain textures of food so much that I just will purposefully want to eat just specifically a certain texture of food for a while. So... Yeah, exactly. I said something about toffee hard candy and the texture of toast that I wanted um, toast to have like the candy. I wanted like candied toast. And then I wasn't sure how to do that. I kind of wanted something like a toast lollipop, but there really wasn't a such thing as a toast lollipop. Um, like what I'd been imagining was, um, like the way that a sugar daddy would be, you know, the sugar daddy lollipops, like that kind of toffee where it's like a thick kind of toffee that becomes where it's like. Yeah, a sugar daddy. It's an old candy. I'm not being weird. It's it's an old candy. <laughs> there are sugar babies and then there's sugar daddies. And I'm talking about candies with those names. They are old candies. <laughs> so 
So what I had been thinking of is having a toast that is not only something that has like a chewy caramel on it, but like completely encased in the sugar daddy. So you're like licking the sugar daddy off of a perfectly preserved crunchy toast. And I was thinking a way to accomplish that is if you take the toast and it's been made, but then you make it crispier by like dehydrating it, which might not be very much of a good idea because I would kind of probably make it more like a crouton, but like imagine like maybe like that whole scratchy toast thing after you've licked off the um, the hard toffee part. Oh, I do. I love toast with butter and jam, but I liked the idea of like a caramel. And so what I ended up doing was make, I, I made like a kind of um, caramel on the stove that would kind of become sort of toffee-like crunchy on it. And I poured that over the toast and I let that kind of harden a little bit, but it was really more more of a gritty crunchy on it. So it wasn't like the it wasn't like smooth around it, but um I think I just added too much sugar to it so it didn't quite become smooth like that. So maybe if I do that again, I should probably add some more butter or something if I want it to be smooth. Uh, anyway, so it ended up being like toast with a light, crunchy, toffee-ish sort of flavor thing on the outside. Um, anyway, because I was craving that randomly, I wanted something that was like that, and it didn't exist. So I wanted like candy toast. I'm not sure how you know about the the toffee hard candy and the texture of toast. I'm wondering if maybe mm. Yeah, I like yo yogurt. Um there is a kind of yogurt that's that's good. I'm not, I'm not for vengeance. <laughs> um, I never thought of that, like oven toasting it. And then adding syrup so that it caramelizes on that. That might be, that might work actually, maybe. I love butterman, uh, butter cinnamon toast too. Oh my goodness. You ever have that? I've been reading this whole time. You know what my hands look like. Yeah, I mean, that's true. 
air fryers could potentially work. I'm going to um, share you a link with the candy and see what, what they look like. And, or maybe my phone is not dead. Let's find out, is my phone dead? <gasps> my phone is not dead. That's so strange. Wow. I don't see how that's a dark side. But that's very funny. Okay. So where should I go to for this Bing? Bing. Yeah, I will look them up for you. <laughs> it's a lollipop that is okay sugar daddy candy bar on a stick sugar daddy is a candy bar on a stick manufactured by tootsie roll industries that is essentially a moderately hard brick of caramel a bite-sized caramel flavored jelly bean candy Based on the Sugar Daddy, is marketed under the name Sugar Babies. Um, and I used to actually, um, on Discord, I used to have a photo uh, when I had gone to a candy shop near me that has old candies, like old things like that. And I bought a bunch of different candies. Um, my profile picture on Discord used to be one that included a sugar daddy, a sugar daddy lollipop, um, because they're so good. They're so good. Look at that. Anyway, you lick it, and it becomes pliable. <laughs> <laughs> They're absolutely amazing. The sugar daddy. Mm. Look at that. Mm. Now I'm going to look up sugar baby candy. Sugar babies. And these are like a softened caramel flavor thing. It's softer than a Werther's. I mean, of course it's softer than a Werther's, but it's like... It's like the texture of a jelly bean, but it's it's a really good caramel flavor. Oh my goodness. Hmm. There's also a picture here of gourmet fruit slices, which are also out of this world. Um, and then I probably still have the picture on here. Okay. 
Okay, so it's not on device, but where would it be? This is so strange. Okay. Well, I'm not sure how to access this. Sharing? No? No. Favorites? No. Search. <laughs> that worked. Here we go. This was my profile picture at one point. On Discord. <laughs> Blue Raspberry Pop Rocks. That is a twin bing. And the... Um, that means it's a package with two... Um, chocolate covered cherries, candy, and the, the Bing is like, it's like these crispy, it's, it's chocolate with, um, Chocolate with nuts on it, and inside it's got the the cherry flavored candy. I don't remember if the cherry part is actually like a whole cherry or if it's just like cherry mashed candy, if that makes sense, where it's like... Hmm... And Dr. Pepper soda bottles, me Dr. Pepper soda bottles, which were not as good as I thought they would be, but they were they were pretty decently good. Um, there's a sugar daddy down there. Sugar Daddy Lollipop. And there's Toffee Fay. Toffee Fay is one of my favorites. No. Okay, so it just shut off. Yeah, it's um it was my first profile picture on there. Before, I didn't have a profile picture, um, and I didn't know what I wanted my picture to be yet. So that's why I selected that. I don't remember how many years ago that was my picture, but it was my picture for a while. Um, well, I, I would tell you, but my phone just powered off. But anyway. <laughs> oh, tell me you've had a Tootsie Roll. If you're confused too by Tootsie Roll, then that's really, you'll need to have a Tootsie Roll at least once in your life. 
a real Tootsie Roll. Like, not one of the midges Tootsie Rolls, but, like, the true thing where it's, like, the package where it's, like, Or the chocolate taffy is like in the kind of like bricks, like you know what I mean? Hmm. A Tootsie Roll. Do you not know what Tootsie Rolls are? Do you not know what they are? It's a chocolate taffy. They're a delicious chocolate taffy. And the same company makes something called Flavor Rolls. And those are delicious. They're delicious um, fruit flavored rolls. They even have um, a vanilla one. The vanilla flavor roll. And that one is cream colored. Um, but they have one that has like a orange color. There's there's one that has more of a um, bluish color. And I think that one was supposed to be. I don't remember exactly. Anyway, um, yeah, I loved Sprite. I love Sprite. Sprite's my favorite soda, and gummy bears are my favorite candy. <laughs> mm. <But> anyway. <laughs> Uh, nope, not 10 years ago. I can tell you it was far more recent than 10 years ago. But it was, um, I don't know how many years ago it was. You have never had Tootsie Rolls. I'm so sorry. They're delicious. They're chocolate flavored. Which I know might sound like a bad texture, but they are absolutely addictive. I had no idea that you didn't have those. Yeah, flavor rolls are good too. Have you ever had salt water taffy? Um, flavor rolls are like salt water taffy, except they don't have the salt water flavor that salt water taffy has. Salt water taffy is also absolutely addictive, and it's great because spring is almost here. And it's the perfect time for salt water taffy. And they come in all kinds of flavors. Um. Oh my gosh, that's a very difficult one. It's kind of like caramel. But it's not. I don't know what my accent is. Uh, taffy. Oh, taffy is not toffee. Taffy is... Oh my goodness, did you think I meant... Taffy is a... It's a candy where it's it's been pooled and pooled until it becomes this...
um, chewy, chewy substance. Um, but toffee is, is like a, it's like caramel, but it's when the caramel becomes like, when the caramel becomes a hard candy, then that's like toffee. That's toffee. So like a Heath bar has toffee. Um... What else? I believe score is is also toffee. Well, yeah, honestly, um, it is pretty American to be a little bit into. <laughs> Like, the whole thing of, like, candy stuff. Toffee is Tom's coffee. I don't know what toffee... I don't know what you mean by that. Toffee is Tom's coffee. That is interesting, though, that you say that, because I know that to fee, to fee, um, I know that instead of you saying a caramel apple, I've heard that, I've heard that some people, instead of saying caramel apple, they say taffy apple or toffee apple. Yeah, toffee apple. Instead of a caramel apple. And we have, we have those, but they're called caramel. Because there's the, the softened caramel, and then there's the... Thank you. Um, <laughs> oh, I can't, I actually can't, um, when I was a kid, I had my ears pierced, and I had an issue where every time I tried to put the earrings in, my ears would close back up again. And so it was as though I was piercing my ears all over again every time I tried to put earrings in. So I just gave up, and then I um, let the ear holes close up. And then um, when I was a little older like maybe 13, I don't know, um, I went and I got my ears pierced again. And so I have like, let me see if I can feel where they are. I have like the imprint of where they are, but they, what happened was they, um, it continued. The weird issue I had before just still 
continued, where if I ever tried to put earrings into the holes, even though it was long past when it should be healing, it wouldn't. It would be like pierce peel up and the I can feel but I mean but oh I'm responding to comments you can't see. Okay, I will explain. Um I don't know if you are watching from a TV or if you are watching from a uh, phone, I don't know, but if you have live chat turned on instead of top chat, it will show every message that people are saying. Um, so, where was it? I know I saw it up here. Oh, um, Pookie said... You should wear big circle earrings and a cute necklace or choker made out of teddy bears. Um, so I was thinking, I ear piercing doesn't work for me. I tend to heal up, so. It's okay, though, so. Anyway. Oh, gosh. <clears throat> it's saying the connection is unstable. Please wait while reconnecting. Is it still working or did it freeze? Did it freeze? If it froze, I am so sorry. I'm just going to ask really quick if it froze. Okay. I'm not telling any secrets. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> hmm. Anyway, I don't remember what I was going to say. Um, I do not know. I do not know. You would have to ask him that. Sometimes things happen very randomly in the chat, and it's all right. Tootsie Roll. You didn't get to see that either, what a Tootsie Roll is. So I'm going to... Do you at least know what a Tootsie Pop is? It's funny how the more I think about it, the more I realize that every Tootsie product is delicious. A Tootsie Pop has a ball of a Tootsie Roll. Surrounded by a delicious lollipop. Then it can be of several different flavors. There's chocolate and there are fruit flavors. Anyway, so I, I love a lot of different candies though. Um, so, I bet they have flavor roll pops. Oh my gosh. Anyway, so, So I'm going to to share with you. I don't know if it will links not oh, not Amazon. I just mean 
I just mean they tend to do this crazy thing where they all of this like so <laughs> difficult to paste links. It's like they don't want people pasting links. I don't understand that. So I'm going to do There we go. Copy. Mm, tootsie roll. Mm. What other stream? Hmm? I'm not sure what you mean. Mm. Okay. <laughs> what do you mean by other stream? Oh, I'm not going to another stream. I was going to um, to Amazon. I was going on Amazon. Mm. You should just go over to live chat and see the whole chat. There's top chat and then there's live chat so you can see everything everybody says. <laughs> Are you saying there's another stream that I should be watching right now? That I don't know? Hmm. I know. Okay. Anyway. I'm sure they can see your comments. <laughs> Wait, are you serious? Are you actually able to do something where you cloak your comments? That would be funny. <laughs> you really can't see his comments. Wow. That's interesting. So is that why you do that? Okay, boy with the thorn in his side, Pookie is here. Pookie is um, somebody who uses a phrase, which I cannot repeat, as his screen name. And I believed all this time. It's, this has been like many, many nostalgia parties. He has spoken, and most of the time, people can see his um, comments. But he's saying that if somebody has a filter on, that they cannot see his comments because of a filter that is filtering out his very name. 
So he is able to hide his comments by hiding his um, his very screen name. Okay, good. So people can see. So they know that that I'm not making up that there's a pookie here. Although he doesn't that's that's not how he <laughs> that's not um that's not what the phrase is that he uses, but that's what he calls himself by is pookie. So I don't, um, it's what his friends call him, is Pookie. <laughs> this is becoming so funny because I'm thinking like there may be people who are watching this who can't even see your messages. But I don't know why that makes it really funny to me. The confusion I'm sending people down. Oh my goodness. And you want me to go to Urban Dictionary for Pookie? <laughs> Maybe it's a prank. Maybe Pookie means something. <laughs> Oh. There's nothing wrong with Pookie. Good. Unless I've found the wrong thing. It says one Pookie without the other Pookie is nothing. They are cute together, boop each other's noses, and love being weird. Together they are themselves. Though they are complete opposites, their personalities balance out, and together they will grow for the rest of their lives. So, is that what that means, Pookie? I just know that Pookie is laughing so hard. I can see, like, all these... <laughs> I'm just imagining whoever Pookie is, like, laughing so hard that he's, like, trying to catch his breath. <laughs> because he seems so... Hmm... Mm. Okay, so Pookie says it's Czech mythology, and it's Pookie, and it was a rabbit, and from another, um, another stream, he said something about it being, it sounded like he was saying it's similar to Krampus. But I'll look up what the, not look up, but I'll see what is the other definition. Hmm. 
Societal nonconformists. That seems like somebody just being rude about what that means, though. Right? At first, I thought that Pookie meant, like, Garfield's teddy bear, Pookie. find a Pookie Rabbit um, by Ivy L. Wallace. Uh, and it says it was posted in 1946. Could that be the one that you are referring to? That's cool. Okay. I did not know that boy with a thorn in his side couldn't see you. <laughs> Does that mean I am pooky then? If I like candy? Of course, I wouldn't steal candy, though. So I don't even know why I said that. <laughs> okay. All right, so... Four. And grandfather's former study... Which, even on the hottest days, was the damnedest. 
I don't know, this is so funny to me. Like, I had no idea that some of you couldn't see him. <laughs> um, so, to tell you... I typically will hit the check mark so that um, whatever is said in the live chat continues to be shown in the live chat when you do um, when you go back and rewatch a live chat. So if there's ever anything that you say during a live stream but you don't feel comfortable with sharing for other people to see later on um, um just letting you know that um so if you ever see anything i'll see anything but i mean if you ever say anything that you don't feel comfortable with um just know that it will show up later, unless you delete it. Um, you can actually um, censor oneself that way. Like, you can send a message and then delete the message. If you feel uncomfortable, uh, uncomfortable about anything that you say. I'm just saying that, but I don't feel like anybody should feel uncomfortable with anything they say here. Yeah. Well, see, I thought the reason people couldn't see all the messages was that um, the live chat feature makes it possible for you to see everything, but I thought that people, um, <laughs> that is so funny. <laughs> because I'm thinking back, like, there are so many times during streams where I will just be, like, reading things that are being said and, like, commenting on them. And I'm just imagining if some people don't know what was being written, they're probably so confused. But that is funny to me. Hmm. Okay, so I'm going to keep reading. And grandfather's former study, which even on the hottest days was the dampest room in their country house, no matter how much they opened the windows that looked straight out on grim dark fir trees, his foliage was so thick and intricate that it was impossible to say where one tree ended and another began. In this uninhabited room where a bronze boy with violin stood on the bare desk, there was an unlocked bookcase containing the thick volumes of an extinct illustrated magazine. Lucian would swiftly leaf through them until he reached the page where between a poem by Korfinski, crowned with a harp-shaped vignette, and a miscellany section containing information about shifting swamps, American eccentrics, and the length of human intestine, there was the woodcut of a chessboard. Not a single picture could arrest Lucian's hand as it leafed through volumes. Neither the celebrated Niagara Falls nor starving Indian children pot-bellied like skeletons, nor an attempted assassination of the King of Spain. The life of the world passed by with a hasty rustle and suddenly stopped. The treasured diagram, problems, openings, entire games... 
at the beginning of the summer holidays. He had sorely missed his aunt and the old gentleman with the bunch of flowers, especially that fragrant old man smelling at times of violets and at times of lilies of the valley, depending on what flowers he had brought to Lucian's aunt. Usually he would arrive just right, a few minutes after Lucian's aunt had glanced at her watch and left the house. Never mind, let's wait a while, the old man would say, removing the damp paper from his bouquet, and Lucian would draw up an armchair for him to the table, where the chessmen had already been set out. The appearance of the old gentleman with the flowers had provided with him, so it provided him with a way out of a rather awkward situation. After three or four truancies from school, it became apparent this aunt really had really no aptitude for chess. As the game proceeded, her pieces would conglomerate in an unseemly jumble, out of which there would suddenly dash an exposed helpless king. But the old gentleman played divinely. The first time, I honestly, used to thank you for the wonderful lilies of the valley. The first time the old man had sat down inside, her fumes, Lucian's ears were burning and there was nowhere to advance. It seemed to Lucian he was playing a completely different game from the one his aunt had taught him. The board was bathed in fragrance. The old man called the officer a bishop and the tower a rook. And whenever he made a move that was fatal, his opponent, he would immediately take it back as if disclosing the mechanism of an expensive instrument, he would show the way his opponent should have played in order to avert disaster. He won the first 15 games without the slightest effort, not pondering his moves for a moment, but during the 16th game, he suddenly began to think and won with difficulty. While on the last day, the day he drove up with a whole bush of lilac, for which no place could be found, and the boy's aunt darted about on tiptoe in her bedroom, and then presumably left by the back door. On this last day, after a long, exciting struggle, during which the old man revealed a capacity for breathing hard through his nose, Lucian perceived something. Something was set free within him, something cleared up, and the mental myopia that had been, oh, well, it's a draw, said the old man. He moved his queen back and forth a few times the way you move the lever of a broken machine and repeated, a draw, perpetual check. See if it would work. Wiggled it, wiggled it, and then sat still, staring stiffly at the board. You'll go far, said the old man. You'll go far if you continue on the same lines. Tremendous progress. Never saw anything like this old man who explained to Lucian the simple method of notation in chess, and Lucian, replaying the games given in the magazine, soon discovered in himself a quality he had once envied when his stand how his father-in-law could read a score for hours and hear in his mind all the movements of the music as he ran his eye over the notes, now smiling, now frowning, and sometimes turning his back a reader, checking a detail in a novel, a name, the time of the year. It must be a great pleasure, his father had said, to assimilate music in its natural state, over the letters and numbers representing moves. At first he learned to replay the immortal games that remained from former tournaments. He would rapidly glance over the notes of chess and silently move the pieces on the board. Now and then, this or that move provided in the text with an exclamation or a question mark, depending on whether it habitually played, would be followed by several series of moves in parentheses, since that remarkable move branched out like a river, and every branch had to be traced to its conclusion before one returned to the main channel. These possible continuations that explained the essence of blunder or foresight, Lucian gradually ceased to reconstruct actually on the board and contented himself with perceiving their melody mentally through the sequence of symbols and signs. Similarly, he was able to read a game already perused once without using the board at all, and this was all the more pleasant in that he did not have to fiddle about with chessmen while constantly listening for someone coming. The door, it is true, was locked. 
and he would open it unwillingly after the brass handle had been jiggled many times. And Lucian Sr., coming to see what his son was doing in that damp, uninhabited room, would find his son restless and sullen with red ears on the desk lay bound volumes of the magazine, and Lucian Sr. would be seized by the suspicion that his son might have been looking for pictures of naked women. Why do you lock yourself up? he would ask, and little Lucian would draw his head into his shoulders and with hideous clarity imagine his father looking under the sofa and finding the chest set. The air in here is really icy, and what's so interesting about these old magazines? Let's go and see if there are any red mushrooms under the fir trees. Yes, they were there, those edible red bullets. Green needles adhered to their delicately brick-colored caps, and sometimes a blade of grass would leave on one of them a long, narrow trace. Their undersides might be holy, and occasionally a yellow slug would be sitting there, and Lucian Sr. would use his pocket knife to clean moss and soil from the thick, speckled gray root of each mushroom before placing it in the basket. His son followed behind him at a few paces distance, with his hands behind his back like a little old man, and not only did he not look for mushrooms, but even refused to admire those his father with little quacks of pleasure unearthed himself, and sometimes plump and pale in the dreary white dress that did not become her. Miss Lucian would appear at the end of the avenue and hurry toward them, passing alternately through sunlight and shadow, and the dry leaves that never ceased to occur in the northern woods would rustle beneath the slightly skewed high heels of her white slippers. One July day, she slipped on the veranda steps and sprained her foot, and for a long time afterwards, she lay in bed, either in her darkened bedroom or on the veranda wearing a pink negligee. <laughs> Her face heavily powdered, and there would always be a small silver bowl with bull de gong, balls of hard candy standing on a little table beside her. The foot was soon better, but she continued to recline as if having made up her mind that this was to be her lot, that this precisely was her destiny in life. Summer was unusually hot. The mosquitoes gave no peace. All day long, the shrieks of peasant girls bathing could be heard from the river, and on one such oppressive and voluptuous day, early in the morning before the gadflies had yet begun to torment the black horse daubed with pungent ointment, Lucian Sr. stopped into the calash and was taken to the station to spend the day in town. At least be reasonable. It's essential for me to see Silvestroff, he said to his wife the night before, pacing about the bedroom in his mouse-colored dressing gown. Really, how queer you are. Can't you see this is important? I myself would prefer not to go. But his wife continued to lie with her face thrust into the pillow and her fat, helpless back shook with sobs. Nonetheless, in the morning he left, and his son standing in the garden saw the top part of the coachman and his father's hat skim along the serrated line of young firs that fenced off the garden from the road. That day, Lucian Jr. was in low spirits. All the games in the old magazine had been studied. All the problems solved, and he was forced to play with himself. But this ended inevitably in an exchange of all the pieces and a dull draw, and it was unbearably hot. The veranda cast a black triangular shadow on the bright sand, the avenue was paved with sunflecks, and these spots, if you slitted your eyes, took on the aspect of regular light and dark squares. An intense lattice-like shadow lay flat beneath a garden bench. 
The urns that stood on stone pedestals at the four corners of the terrace threatened one another across their diagonals. Swallows soared, their flight recalled the motion of scissors, swiftly cutting out some design. Not knowing what to do with himself, he wandered down the footpath by the river, and from the opposite bank came the ecstatic squeals and glimpses of naked bodies. He stole behind a tree trunk, and with beating heart peered at these flashes of light. A bird rustled in the branches, and taking fright, he quickly left the river and went back. He had lunch alone with the housekeeper, a taciturn, sallow-faced old woman who always gave off a slight smell of coffee. Afterwards, lolling on the drawing-room couch, he drowsily listened to all manner of slight sounds, to an oriole's cry in the garden, to the buzzing of a bumblebee that had flown in the window, to the tinkle of dishes on a tray being carried down from his mother's bedroom. And these limpid sounds were strangely transformed in his reverie, and assumed the shape of bright, intricate patterns on a dark background. And in trying to unravel them, he fell asleep. He was wakened by the steps of the maid dispatched by his mother. It was dim and cheerless in the bedroom. His mother drew him to her, but he braced himself and turned away so stubbornly that she had to let him go. Come, tell me something, she said softly. He shrugged his shoulders and picked at his knee with one finger. Don't you want to tell me anything? she asked still more softly. He looked at the bedside table put a bowl de gum in his mouth and began to suck. He looked, he took a second, a third, another, and another, until his mouth was full of sweet, thudding, and bumping balls. Take some more, take as many as you wish, she murmured, and stretching one hand from under the bedclothes, she tried to touch him, to stroke him. You haven't got tanned at all this year, she said after a pause, but perhaps I simply can't see. The light here is so dead, everything looks blue. Raise the Venetian blinds, please. Or wait, stay. Later. Having sucked his boule de gomme to the end, he inquired if he could leave. She asked him what he would do now, and would he not like to drive to the station and meet his father off at the seven o'clock train? Let me go, he said. It smells of medicine in here. He tried to slide down the stairs the way they did at school, the way, him, the way he himself never did it there, but the steps were too high. Beneath the staircase, in a cupboard that had still not been thoroughly explored, he looked for magazines. He dug out one and found a checker section in it, diagrams of stupid, clumsy, round blobs on their boards, but there was no chess. As he rummaged on, he kept coming across a bothersome herbarium album with dried edelweiss and purple leaves in it and with inscriptions in pale violet ink. In a childish thin spun hand that was so different from his mother's present handwriting, Davos 1885, Gacina 1886, wrathfully he began to tear out the leaves and flowers, sneezing from the fine dust as he squatted on his haunches amid the scattered books. Then it got so dark beneath the stairs that the pages of the magazine he was again leafing through began to merge into a gray blur, and sometimes a small picture would trick him because it looked like a chess problem in the diffused darkness. He thrust the books back anyhow into the drawers and wandered into the, into the drawing room, thinking listlessly that it must be well past seven o'clock since the butler was lighting the kerosene lamps. Leaning on a cane and holding on to the banisters, his mother and mauve Penoir came heavily down the stairs, a frightened look on her face. I don't understand why your father isn't here yet, she said, and moving with difficulty, she went out onto the veranda and began to peer down the road between the fir trunks that the setting sun banded with bright copper. He came only around ten, said he had missed the train, had been extremely busy, had dined with his publisher. No, no soup, thank you. He laughed and spoke very loudly and ate noisily, and Lucian was struck by the feeling that his father was looking at him all the time as if staggered by his presence. Dinner grated into late evening tea. Mother, her elbow propped on the table, silently slitted her eyes at her plate of raspberries. 
and the gayer her husband's stories became, the narrower her eyes grew. Then she got up and quietly left, and it seemed to Lucian that all this had happened once before. He remained alone on the veranda with his father and was afraid to raise his head, feeling that strange searching stare on him the whole time. Have you been passing how have you been passing the time? asked his father suddenly. What have you been doing? Nothing, replied Lucian. And what are you planning to do now? asked Lucian Senior in the same tone of forced jollity, imitating his son's manner of using the formal plural for you. Do you want to go to the bed or do, sorry, do you want to go to bed or do you want to sit here with me? Lucian killed a mosquito and very cautiously stole a glance upwards and sideways at his father. There was a crumb on his father's beard and an unpleasantly mocking expression gleamed in his eyes. Do you know what? His father said, and the crumb jumped off. Do you know what? Let's play some game. For instance, how about me teaching you chess? He saw his son slowly blush, and taking pity on him, immediately added, Or Kabbalah, there is a pack of cards over there in the table drawer. But no chess set. We have no chess set said Lucian huskily, and again stole a cautious look at his father. The good ones remained in town, said his father placidly, but I think there are some old ones in the attic. Let's go take a look. And indeed, by the light of the lamp that his father held aloft, among all sorts of rubbish in a case, Lucian found a chessboard, and again he had the feeling that all this had happened before. That open case with a nail sticking out of its side, those dust powdered books, that wooden chessboard with a crack down the middle. A small box with a sliding lid also came to light. It contained puny chessmen, and the whole time he was looking for the chess set and then carrying it down to the veranda. Lucian tried to figure out whether it was by accident that his father had mentioned chess, or whether he had noticed something, and the most obvious explanation did not he turns out to be a move that seemed barred, impossible. Okay, I'm going to pause there. To, okay, so here um, there are two things I that um, we're definitely um, throws when he that he had experienced this all before. Um, it's like the thing with the crumb, his father having the crumb in the beard. Um, it's like the moment that um, the woman with the his aunt had tossed a crumb and it landed in his father's beard, and then um, his mother ran off crying. Uh, so there's that. So that has happened again. And that also, um, the moment earlier in the book, much, much earlier in the book, um, when he was a boy and they were about to they're about to move, I think. And the boy ran back to the house and he was hiding in the house. He saw that room and he saw the, um, the broken board. Um, but now there's this kind of because it's been tied together now, we get that the board is probably broken because of the father probably broke the board 
Now, the thing about the violinist, it could be that he used to play the game with the violinist. And that set off the kind of cheating and affairs that happened between those four characters. The um, Lucian's real father, the violinist, um, the aunt, and, um, and Lucian's own mother. Um, August, this book is called The Defense, and it is about, um, its main character is a character named Lucian, who is Lucian Jr., and his father, um, tries to encourage him to have any kind of hobby and for a large portion of the, the story uh, so far he didn't uh, he didn't have any hobbies and then and then he discovers a chessboard and, um, and that angers his father, and he quickly, quickly tries to get his son to, um, go to his room, and only now, finally, is he, um, Is he okay, I guess, with with Lucian learning to play? But Lucian has already learned how to play now. Um, so there's... I take it either... Either his father, not really his father though, but... Lucian Sr. Either Lucian Sr. went to the aunt's house, who was banished from even visiting anymore. Um, either he went there and found out about Lucian going there and learning how to play, or he took a train to see the violinist, who is Lucian's real father. Or he cheated. There's that possibility too. Um, but anyway, so. But anyway, um, it's about Lucian's um, just basically he gets into chess and then he gets obsessed with it to the point that kind of his reality sort of merges with chess very slowly as it goes on. Uh, let me see. There are some things <laughs> there are some things I may have missed here. Um, August, I want to ask you something. Are you able to see, when you go into live chat, I'm just curious, are you able to see Pookie's messages? Because boy with a thorn in his side was here earlier and could not see Pookie's messages at all. And um, I had no idea that could happen. So sometimes I comment on something that 
he is dead, and nobody even knows what I'm talking about or who I'm talking to. It's funny. Oh, wow. I am thirty one. Yeah, the thing about that, he's mentioning the mushrooms and the pine made me think that it almost seemed like, but then I wasn't sure if I was just seeing it that way or, or not. <laughs> So, August, you can see El Palaco, but can you see... Can you see Pookie? You know who Pookie is, El Palaco. Well, I can see, I can see everything, but I didn't know that other people can't see everything. And he's saying that <laughs> he's saying that the boy with a thorn in his side may have activated a filter by typing all caps. That YouTube's AI may have created a filter. When he typed in all caps. Like when he says things like, Hungry! <laughs> oh, so you think that 
the boy with the thorn in his side was possibly just pretending not to see him. That is possible because he was he was pretending not to hear me yesterday when I plugged the thing back into it for a new stream and I plugged the USB microphone in again but had to re restart stream with a different stream. Yeah. So he was saying that he couldn't hear but it but Mario was saying that he could. So it could have been just a joke that he was playing then here to do. No. Anyway. Yeah, I don't know if he was or wasn't. So. Um. But this is how far I've read for now. Um, A small box with a sliding lid. I didn't know that. I didn't know that writing in capital letters usually gets one blocked or booted. Or that it could activate a filter. That's a good thing though because I feel like people shouldn't write in all caps. <laughs> oh, El Polaco is, is um, testing it. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> but is Discord Google? I mean, I know it uses bots, but does Discord have that kind of thing? With all caps? Because I thought for sure I've been able to use all caps before. I thought. Hmm. Um... I'm not typing, though. <laughs> so... One time, I was on a live stream with Mary, and she said, it was look up, wake up, and she said that something was kind of blooping. Not blooping, I didn't mean blooping, but that, the, that YouTube was censoring me somehow, but I hadn't said something that was bad. And I was like, but I didn't say something. But she said something like, Google catches things. So Google catches things even if they're catching things wrong, apparently. If they think that something is something that's supposed to be censored, it censors it. Um... I saw a live stream of hers recently um, on her channel, and she 
she developed pneumonia. So she has pneumonia right now. She has COVID and pneumonia uh, right now. And also she has two surgeries coming up. Uh, she said something. She said something in her stream um, that she does have some people around her who are helping her with her children right now. Um, they are they are able to be there for her right now and everything. Um, so please. Um, please keep her in your thoughts and go, go to our channel and pass on good thoughts to her. She's look up, wake up. Or Mary Bearski. Sometimes, sometimes her lives disappear. And I think that she does it on purpose because maybe things maybe she gets uncomfortable. Telling people things afterwards. Um, I'm going to share the link for her. Um, so she, she might not, she might not be able to be live in the next few months, but maybe before then she might be able to go live. I am not sure. Um, she took down the live stream. I thought it might still be there, but I don't see it. So please keep her in your thoughts. Um, and prayers. Yeah. I hope so too. Um, I, I know in some way how the algorithm works, but it is, it's, um, it's like, sometimes if you don't tag something if it sees something that is kind of like the way that when you um, search search an image for something that's in it, like if you were to um, take a picture and like let's say you want to look up an item that's in that picture 
to find other items like it or find where you could shop by it. Um, I feel like YouTube does that too, that they are implementing that. Um, with the way that they turn around and um, suggest things to people. And then, of course, there is um, there's the whole thing with watch history. And so when people have watch history on, they especially will start um, recommending things based off of off of um, those things. I don't have my watch history on, and yet YouTube still found a way to to recommend things that I've watched to see them, like to rewatch them, and so it's like I don't see what the point is of giving people an option to turn off watch history if it honestly is never turned off on YouTube's end. Like, they can still see your watch history. They clearly can, but they, they are giving you a choice and saying, um, <laughs> you don't have to see your watch history, but they're still seeing your watch history. It's very, very weird, honestly. Thank you. Um, yeah, I hope that she gets well, too. And that her... Her children are doing well. Um... She was singing um, the song from A Walk to Remember. In the stream. And crying. Um, I wish I lived closer to where she is. I don't. Um, well, there's nothing wrong with the algorithm <laughs> uh, indexing watch history. It's just that YouTube recommendations were so very constant uh, a while back, and um, I started to feel like I wanted YouTube to recommend things to me that were a lot more uh, random than that. Um, and I feel like what they've done has made it a little bit more, um, a little less predictable, but, because sometimes you want to really discover things that maybe you wouldn't be able to discover. Instead of it just saying, well, because you've watched this, you want to see this again, and you want to see this again, and you want to see this again. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
because for a while it was like that. It would be like, you want to hear this song again, don't you? It, almost. It was like, but I don't want to hear this song right now. Just because I listened to it. I don't know. It's... It's a strange thing. Um, but I do have watch history turned on for the Disgo's channel. No, I don't know what a session cookie is. Yeah, um, and I do like the recommendations, but at least the recommendations when you don't have watch history turned on, at least they are a lot more random feeling. And it feels less like they are pushing what you've seen many, many, many times. Okay, see, that that's like a different language to me. I'm not sure what a session layer is and i don't know what osi model means either so i don't know what that means i know what e encryption is though um You mean like ad blocking and, uh, what is it called again? Mm, there's, there's a weird word for it. Certificate? Sometimes if you like click around that area, there's like web certificates and, um, you have to allow web certificates. Facebook used to be really difficult. Well, not difficult, but Facebook used to have strange errors that had to do with um, that. You would, like, sometimes the web certificates would have to be allowed or something to be so that you could see the screen because instead... Uh, the way it was supposed to look, you would have, like, a blue bar, and then it would be a white screen. You couldn't log in. You couldn't do anything. And I only ever saw that with Facebook. I'm trying to think, what browser did I use back then? It was either Internet Explorer or Google Chrome. But anyway.
Hmm. That is interesting. I do not have 5G. Um, I am not sure what I have actually. <laughs> I've got Cricket. It's the cheapest around me. And it's simple. So I like it. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to continue reading. And the whole time he was looking for the chess set and then carrying it down to the veranda. Lucian tried to figure out whether it was by accident his father had mentioned chess or whether he had noticed something, and the most obvious explanation did not occur to him, just as sometimes in solving a problem, its key turns out to be a move that seemed barred, impossible, excluded quite naturally from the range of possible moves. And now, when the board had been placed on the illuminated table between the lamp and the raspberries, and its dust wiped off with a bit of newspaper, his father's face was no longer mocking. And Lucian, forgetting his fear, forgetting his secret, felt permeated all at once with proud excitement at the thought that he could, if he wanted, display his art. His father began to set out the pieces. One of the pawns was replaced by an absurd purple-colored affair in the shape of a tiny bottle. In place of one rook, there is a checker. The knights were headless, and one's, one horse's head that remained after the box had been emptied, leaving a small die and a red counter, turned out not to fit any of them. When everything had been set out, Lucian suddenly made up his mind and muttered, I already can play a little. Who taught you? asked his father without lifting his head. I learned it at school, replied Lucian. Some of the boys could play. Oh, fine, said his father and added, quoting Pushkin's doomed duelist, let's start if you are willing. He has played chess since his youth but only seldom and sloppily with haphazard opponents on serene evenings aboard a Volga steamer in the foreign sanatorium where his brother was dying years ago here in the country with the village doctor, an unsociable man who periodically ceased calling on them, and all these chance games full of oversights and sterile meditations were for him little more than a moment of relaxation or simply a means of decently preserving silence in the company of a person with whom conversation kept petering out. Brief, uncomplicated games, remarkable neither for their ambition nor inspiration, which he always began in the same way, paying little attention to his adversary's moves, 
although he made no fuss about losing, he secretly considered himself to be not at all a bad player, and told himself that if ever he lost, it was through absent-mindedness, good nature, or a desire to enliven the game with daring sallies, and he considered that with a little application it was possible, without theoretic knowledge, to refute any gambit out of the textbook. His son's passion for chess had so astounded him, seemed so unexpected, and at the same time so fateful and inescapable, so strange and awesome was it to sit on this bright veranda amid the black summer night across from this boy who tensed, whose tensed forehead seemed to expand and swell as soon as he bent over the pieces all this was so strange and awesome that Lucian Sr. was incapable of thinking of the game, and while he feigned concentration, his attention wandered from the vague recollections of his illicit day in St. Petersburg that left a residue of shame it was better not to investigate to the casual, easy gestures with which his son moved this or that piece. The game had lasted but a few minutes when his son said, If you do this, it's mate, and if you do that, you lose your queen. And he, confused, took his move back and began to think properly, inclining his head first to the left and then to right, slowly stretching out his fingers toward the queen and quickly snatching them away again, as if burned. While in the meantime, his son, calmly and with uncharacteristic tidiness, put the taken pieces into their box. Finally, Lucian Sr. made his move whereupon there started a devastation of his positions, and then he laughed unnaturally and knocked his king over in a sign of surrender. In this way, he lost three games and realized that should he play ten more, the result would be just the same, and yet he was unable to stop. At the very beginning of the fourth game, Lucian pushed back the piece moved by his father and, with a shake of his head, said in a confident, unchildlike voice, the worst reply, Jagoran suggests taking the pawn, and when, with the incomprehensible, hopeless speed, he had lost this game as well, Lucian Sr. again laughed and with trembling head began to pour milk into a cut glass tumbler, on the bottom of which lay a raspberry core, which now floated to the surface and circled, unwilling to be extracted. His son put away the board and the box on a wicker table in the corner, and having blurted a phlegmatic good night, softly closed the door behind him. Oh well. I should have expected something like this, said Lucian Sr., wiping the tips of his fingers with a kerchief. He's not just amusing himself with chess. He's performing a sacred rite. A fat-bodied, fluffy moth with glowing eyes fell on the table after colliding with the lamp. A breeze stirred lightly through the garden. The clock in the drawing room started to chime daintily and struck twelve. Nonsense, he said. Stupid imagination. Many youngsters are excellent chess players. Nothing surprising in that. The whole affair is getting on my nerves, that's all. Bad of her. She shouldn't have encouraged him. Well, no matter. So he does know. He does know that, that his son visited the aunt who he was not supposed to visit. And it bothers him because, because the violinist, that would confirm that the violinist is the boy's father and not him. He thought drearily that in a moment he would have to lie, to remonstrate, to soothe, and it was midnight already. I want to sleep, he said, but remained sitting in the armchair. And early next morning in the darkest and mossiest corner of the dense coppice behind the garden, 
little Lucian buried his father's precious box of chessmen. Assuming this to be the simplest way of avoiding any kind of complications, for now there were other chessmen that he could use openly. His father, unable to suppress his interest in the matter, went off to see the gloomy country doctor, who was a far better chess player than he, and in the evening after dinner, laughing and rubbing his hands, doing his best to ignore the fact that all this was wrong, but why wrong he could not say, he sat his son down with the doctor at the wicker table on the veranda, himself set out the pieces, agonizing, sorry, apologizing for the purple thingam, sat down beside the players and began avidly to follow the game. <laughs> that also seemed like a weird hmm, double meaning there. Like, he's, he's embarrassed that his son is nothing like him, apparently. <sighs> Twitching his bushy eyebrows and tormenting his fleshy nose with a large, hairy fist, the doctor thought long over every move and from time to time would lean back in his chair as if able to see better from a distance and make big eyes and then lurch heavily forward, his hands braced against his knees. I hope you'll stay, though. He lost and grunted so loudly that his wicker armchair creaked in response. But look, look, exclaimed Lucian Sr. You should go this way and everything is saved. You even have the better position. Don't you see I'm in check? growled the doctor in a bass voice and began to set out the pieces anew. And when Lucian Sr. went out into the dark garden to accompany the doctor as far as the footpath, with its border of glowworms leading down to the bridge, he heard the words he had thirsted to hear once. But now these words weighed heavy upon him. He would rather not have heard them at all. The doctor started coming every night, and since he was really a first-rate player, he derived enormous pleasure from these incessant defeats. He brought Lucian a chess handbook, advising him, however, not to get too carried away by it, not to tire himself, and to read it in the open air. He spoke about the grandmasters he had had the occasion to see, about a recent tournament, and also about the pass of chess about a somewhat doubtful Raja, and about the great Philidor, who was also an accomplished musician. At times, grinning gloomily, he would bring what he termed a sugar plum, an ingenious problem cut out of some periodical. Lucian would pour over it a while, find finally the solution, and with an extraordinary expression on his face and radiant bliss in his eyes would exclaim, blurring his R's, How glorious! How glorious! But the notion of composing problems himself did not entice him. He dimly felt that they would be a pointless waste of the militant, charging, bright force he sensed within him, Whenever the doctor, with strokes of his hairy finger, removed his king farther and farther and finally nodded his head and sat there quite still looking at the board while Lucian Sr., who was always present, always craving a miracle, his son's defeat, 
and was both frightened and overjoyed when his son Juan, had suffered from this complicated mixture of feelings, would seize a knight or rook, crying that everything was not lost, and would himself sometimes play to the end and hopelessly compromised game. And thus it began. Between this sequence of evenings on the veranda and the day when Lucian's photograph appeared in a St. Petersburg magazine, it was as if nothing had been, neither the country autumn drizzling on the asters, nor the journey back to town, nor the return to school. The photograph appeared on an October day soon after his first unforgettable performance in a chess club, and everything else that took place between the return to town and the photograph, two months after all, was so blurry and so mixed up that later, in recalling this time, Lucian was unable to say exactly when, for instance, that social evening had taken place at school, where in a corner, almost unnoticed by his schoolfellows, he had quietly beaten the geography teacher, a well-known amateur, or when his father's invitation, a gray-haired Jew came to dinner, a senile chess genius who had been victorious in all the cities of the world, but now lived in idleness and poverty, blind with a sick heart, having lost forever his fire, his grip, his luck. But one thing Lucian remembered quite clearly, the fear he experienced in school, the fear they would learn of his gift and ridicule him, and consequently guided by this infallible recollection, he judged that after the game played at the social evening, he must not have gone to school any more, for remembering all of the shudders of his childhood, he was unable to imagine the horrible sensation he would have experienced upon entering the classroom on the following morning and meeting those inquisitive, all-knowing eyes. He remembered, on the other hand, that after his picture appeared, he refused to go to school and it was impossible to untangle in his memory the knot in which the social evening and the photograph were joined. It was impossible to say which came first and which second. It was his father who brought him the magazine, and the photograph was taken the previous year on the country. A tree in the garden, and he next to it, a pattern of foliage on his forehead, a sullen expression on his light, slightly inclined face, and those narrow white shorts that always used to come unbuttoned in the front. Instead of the joy expected by his father, he expressed nothing, but he did feel a secret joy. Now this would put an end to school. They pleaded with him during the course of a week. His mother, of course, cried. His father threatened to take away his new chess set. Enormous pieces on a Morocco board. And suddenly, everything was decided of itself. He ran away from home, in his autumn coat since his winter one had been hidden after one unsuccessful attempt to run away, and not knowing where to go, a stinging snow was falling and settling on the cortices and the wind would blow it off, endlessly reenacting this miniature blizzard. He wandered finally to his aunt's place, not having seen her since spring. He met her as she was leaving. She was wearing a black hat and holding flowers wrapped in paper on her way to a funeral. Your old partner is dead, she said. Come with me. Angry not being allowed to warm himself, angry at the snow falling and at the sentimental tears shining behind his aunt's veil. He turned sharply and walked away and after walking for about an hour set off for home. He did not remember the actual return, and even more curiously, he was never sure whether things had happened thus or differently. Perhaps his memory later added much that was taken from his delirium, 
for he was delirious for a whole week, and since he was extremely delicate and high-strung, the doctors presumed he would not pull through. It was not the first time he had been ill, and when later reconstructing the sensation of this particular illness, he involuntarily recalled others, of which his childhood had been full. He remembered especially the time when he was quite small, playing all alone and wrapping himself up in the tiger rug to represent rather forlornly a king. It was nicest of all to represent a king since the imaginary mantle protected him against the chills of fever, and he wanted to postpone for as long as possible that inevitable moment when they would feel his forehead, take his temperature, and then bundle him into bed. Actually, there had been nothing quite comparable to his October chest-permeated illness. The gray-haired Jew who had used to beat Shigorin, the corpse of his aunt's admirer muffled in flowers, the sly, gay countenance of his father bringing a magazine, and the geography teacher petrified with the sadden suddenness of the mate, and the tobacco-smoke-filled room at the chess club where he was closely surrounded by a crowd of university students, and the clean-shaven face of the musician holding for some reason the telephone receiver like a violin. <laughs> Between shoulder and cheek, all this participated in his delirium and took on the semblance of a kind of monstrous game on a spectral, wobbly, wobbly and endlessly disintegrating board. Upon his recovery, a taller, thinner boy he was taken abroad at first to the Adriatic coast where he lay on the garden terrace in the sun and played games in his head, which nobody could forbid him, and then to a German resort where his father took him for walks along footpaths fenced off with twisted beach railings. Sixteen years later, when he revisited this resort, he recognized the bearded earthenware dwarfs between the flower beds and the garden paths of colored gravel before the hotel that had grown bigger and handsomer, and also the dark, damp wood on the hill, and the motley daubs of oil paint, each hue marking the direction of a given walk with which a beech trunk or a rock would be equipped at an intersection, so that the stroller should not lose his way. The same paperweights bearing emerald blue views touched up with mother-of-pearl beneath convex glass, were on sale in the shops near the spring, and no doubt, the same orchestra on the stand in the park was playing potpourris of opera, and the same maples were casting their lively shade all over the small tables where people drank coffee and ate wedge-shaped slices of apple tart with whipped cream. Look, do you see those windows? he said pointing with his cane at the wing of the hotel. It was there we had that pretty little tournament. Some of the most respectable German players took part. I was a boy of 14. Third prize, yes, third prize. He replaced both hands on the crook of his thick cane with that sad, slightly old manish gesture that was natural to him now, and bent his head as if listening to distant music. What? Put on my hat? The sun is scorching, you say? I'd say it is ineffective. Why should you fuss about it? We are sitting in the shade. Nevertheless, he took the straw hat extended to him across the little table, drummed on the bottom where there was a blurred dark spot over the hat maker's name, and donned it with a wry smile. Wry smile. Wry in the precise sense. His right cheek in the corner of his mouth went up slightly, Exposing bad tobacco-stained teeth, he had no other smile, and one would never have said that he was only beginning his fourth decade. From the wings of his nose there descended two deep, flabby furrows, his shoulders were bent, and in the whole of his body one remarked an unhealthy heaviness, and when he rose abruptly with raised elbow, defending himself from a wasp, one saw that he was rather stout. Nothing in the little illusion had foreshadowed this lazy, unhealthy fleshiness. But why does it pester me? He cried in a thin, querulous voice, 
continuing to lift his elbow and endeavoring with his other hand to get out his handkerchief. The wasp, having described one last circle, flew away, and he followed it with his eyes for a long time, mechanically shaking out his handkerchief, and then he set his metal chair more firmly on the gravel, picked up his falling cane, and sat down again, breathing heavily. Why are you laughing? Wasps are extremely unpleasant insects. Frowning, he looked down at the table. Beside his cigarette case lay a handbag semicircular made of black silk. He reached out for it absently and began to click the lock. Shuts badly, he said without looking up. One fine day you'll spill everything out. He sighed, laid the handbag aside, and added the same tone of voice. Yes, the most respectable German players. And one Austrian. My late papa was unlucky. He hoped there would be no real interest in chess here. In chess here. And we landed right in a tournament. Things had been rebuilt and jumbled. The wing of the house now looked different. They had lived over there on the second floor. It had been decided to stay until the end of the year and then return to Russia. And the ghost of school, which his father dared not mention, again loomed into view. His mother went back much earlier, at the beginning of summer. She said she was insanely homesick for the Russian countryside, and that protracted insanely with such plaintive, aching middle syllable was practically the sole intonation of hers that Lucian retained in his memory. She left reluctantly, however, not really knowing whether to go or to stay. It was already some time since she had begun to experience a strange feeling of estrangement from her son, as if he had drifted away somewhere, and the one she loved was not this grown-up boy, not the chess prodigy that the newspapers were writing about, but that little, warm, insupportable child who at the slightest provocation would throw himself flat on the floor, screaming and drumming his feet. And everything was so sad and so unnecessary, that sparse, unfashioned lilac in the station garden, those tulip-shaped lamps in the sleeping car of the Nord Express, and those sinking sensations in the chest, a feeling of suffocation, perhaps angina pectoris, and perhaps, as her husband said, simply nerves. She went away and did not write. <laughs> I just caught that joke. <laughs> Simply nerves, as in, but it is nerves that, okay, anyway. His father grew grayer and moved to a small room, and then one July day, when, his, when little Lucian was on his way home from another hotel, in which lived one of those morose elderly men who were his playmates. Accidentally, in the bright low sun, he caught sight of his father by the wooden railings of a hillside path. His father was with a lady, and since that lady was certainly his young red-haired aunt from St. Petersburg, he was very surprised and somehow ashamed, and he did not say anything to his father. Early one morning, a few days later, so a few days after this, he heard his father swiftly approach his room along the corridor, apparently laughing loudly. The door was burst open, and his father entered, holding out a slip of paper as if thrusting it away. Tears rolled down his cheeks and along his nose as if he had splashed his face with water, and he kept repeating with sobs and gasps, What's this? What's this? It's a mistake. They've got it wrong, and continued to thrust away the telegram. He played in St. Petersburg, Moscow. Oh my gosh, I cannot pronounce that. Nizhny Novgorod, Kiev, Odessa. There appeared a certain Valentinov a cross between tutor and manager. Lucian Sr. wore a black armband mourning for his wife. Oh! 
But he already replaced. He replaced her with, with the ant. Anyway. Lucian wore a black armband mourning for his wife and told provincial journalists that he would never have made such a thorough survey of his native land had he not had a prodigy for a son. He battled at tournaments with the best Russian players. He often took on a score of amateurs. Sometimes he played blind. Lucian Sr., many years later, in the years when his every contribution to immigrate newspapers seemed to him to be his swan song, and goodness knows how many of these swan songs there were, full of lyricism, parents, planned to write a novella about precisely such a chess-playing small boy who is taken from city to city by his father, foster father in the novella. He battled at tournaments with the best Russian players. Hey, where was I? He began to write it in 1928 after returning home from a meeting of the Union of Immigre Writers, at which he had been the only one to turn up. The idea of the book came to him unexpectedly and vividly as he was sitting and waiting in the conference room of a Berlin coffee house. As usual, he had come very early, expressed surprise that the tables had not been placed together, told the waiter to do this immediately, and ordered tea and a pony of brandy. The room was clean and brightly lit, with a still life on the wall representing plump peaches around a watermelon minus one wedge. A clean tablecloth ballooned gently and settled over the connected tables. He put a lump of sugar in his tea, and watching the bubbles rise, warmed his bloodless, always cold hands on the glass. Nearby in the bar, a violin and piano were playing selections from La Traviata, and the sweet music, the brandy, the whiteness of the clean tablecloth, all this made old Lucian so sad, and this sadness was so pleasant that he was loath to move, so he just sat there. One elbow propped on the table, a finger pressed to his temple, a gaunt, red-eyed old man wearing a knitted waistcoat under his brown jacket. The music played, the empty room was flooded with light, and the wound of the watermelon glowed scarlet. And nobody seemed to be coming to the meeting. Several times he looked at his watch, but then the tea and the music bemisted him so mellowly that he forgot about time. He sat quietly, thinking about this and that, about a typewriter he had acquired secondhand, about the Marinsky Theater, about the son who so rarely came to Berlin. And then suddenly, 
he realized that he had been sitting there for an hour, that the tablecloth was still just as bare and white, and in this luminous solitude that seemed to him almost mystical, sitting at a table prepared for a meeting that did not take place, he forthwith decided that after a long absence, literary inspiration had revisited him. Time to do a little slamming up, he thought, and looked around the empty room. Tablecloth, blue wallpaper, still life, the way one looks at a room when a fa where famous man was born. An old Lucian mentally invited his future biographer, who as one came nearer to him in time became paradoxically more and more unsubstantial. more and more remote, to take a good close look at this chance room where the novella The Gambit had been evolved. He drank the rest of his tea in one gulp, donned his coat and hat, learned from the writer waiter that today was Tuesday and not Wednesday, smiled not without certain satisfaction over his own absent-mindedness, and immediately upon returning home removed the black metal cover from his typewriter. The most vivid thing standing before his eyes was the following recollection, slightly retouched by a writer's imagination. A bright hall, two rows of tables, chess boards on the tables. A person sits at each table, and at the back of each sitter, spectators stand in a cluster, craning their necks. And now down the aisle between the tables, looking at no one, hurries a small boy dressed like the... Sarvik, Sar, Sarvich, in an elegant white sailor suit. He stops and turn at each board and quickly makes a move or else lapses briefly in thought, inclining his golden brown head. An onlooker, knowing nothing about simultaneous chess, would be utterly baffled at the sight of these elderly men in black sitting gloomily behind boards that bristled thickly with curiously cut mannequins, while a nimble, smartly dressed lad whose presence here is inexplicable walks slightly from table to table in a strange, tense silence, the only one to move among these petrified people. The writer Lucian did not himself notice the stylized nature of this recollection. Nor did he notice that he endowed his son with the features of a musical rather than a chess-playing prodigy, the result being both sickly and angelic, eyes strangely veiled, curly hair, and a translucent pallor. But now he was faced with certain difficulties, the image of his son, purged of all alien matter and carried to the limits of tenderness, had to be surrounded with some sort of habitus. One thing he decided for sure, he would not let his, he would not let this child grow up, would not transform him into that taciturn person who sometimes called upon him in Berlin, replied to questions monosyllabic, mo, monosyllabic, <laughs> monosyllabically, sat there with his eyes half closed, and then went away leaving an envelope with money in it on the window sill. He will die young, he said aloud, pacing restlessly about the room and around the open typewriter, whose keys were all watching him with their pupils of reflected light. Yes, he will die young. His death will be logical and very moving. He will die in bed while playing his last game. He was so taken with this thought that he regretted the impossibility of beginning the writing of the book from the end. But as a matter of fact, why was it impossible? One could try. He started to guide his thoughts backwards, from this touching and so distinct death back to the hero's vague origin, but presently he thought better of it and sat down at his desk to ponder anew. His son's gift had developed in full only after the war when the Wunder Wunderkind, sorry, Wunderkind turned into the maestro, 
1914, on the very eve of that war which so hindered his memories from ministering to a neat literary plot, he had again gone abroad with his son, and Valentinov went too. Little Lucian was invited to play in Vienna, Budapest, and Rome. The fame of the Russian boy who had already beaten one or two of these players whose names appear in chess textbooks was growing so fast that his own modest literary fame was also being incidentally alluded to in foreign newspapers. All three of them were in Switzerland when the Austrian Archduke was killed. Out of quite casual considerations, the notion that the mountain air was good for his son, Valentinov's remark that Russia had now had no time for chess while his son was kept alive solely by chess, the thought that the war would not last for so long. He had returned to St. Petersburg alone. After a few months, he could stand it no longer and sent for his son. In a bizarre or rotund letter that was somehow matched by its roundabout journey, Valentinov informed him that his son did not wish to come. Lucian wrote again, and the reply, just as oratund and polite, came not from Tarasp, but from Naples. He began to loathe Valentinov. There were days of extraordinary anguish. There were absurd complications with the transfer of money. However, however, Valentinov proposed in one of his next letters to assume all the costs of the boy's maintenance himself. They would settle up later. Time passed. In the unexpected role of war correspondent, he found himself in the Caucasus. Sorry, Caucasus. Days of, an, days of anguish and keen hatred for Valentinov, who wrote however, dil however diligently, were followed by the days of mental peace derived from the feeling that life abroad was good for his son, better than it would have been in Russia, which was precisely what Valentinov affirmed. Now, a decade and a half later, these war years turned out to be an exasperating obstacle. They seemed an encroachment upon creative freedom, for in every book describing the gradual development of a given human personality, one had somehow to mention the war, and even the heroes dying in his youth could not provide a way out of this situation. There were characters and circumstances surrounding his son's image that unfortunately were conceivable only against the background of the war and which could not have existed without this background. With the revolution, it was even worse. The general opinion was that it had influenced the course of every Russian's life. An author could not have his hero go through it without getting scorched and to judge it was impossible. This amounted to a genuine violation of the writer's free will. Actually, how could the revolution affect his son? On the long-awaited day in the fall of 1917, Valentinov appeared just as cheerful, loud and magnific magnificently dressed as before, and behind him was a pudgy young man with a rudimentary mustache. There was a moment of sorrow, embarrassment, and strange disillusionment, the son hardly spoke and kept glancing askance at the window. He's afraid there might be some shooting, explained Valentinov in a low voice. All this resembled a bad dream at first, but one gets used to everything. Valentinov continued to assert that whatever was owed him could be settled among friends later. It turned out that he had important secret business affairs and the money tucked away in all the banks of allied Europe. Young Lusion began to frequent an eminently quiet chess club that had trustfully blossomed forth at the very height of civil chaos, and in spring, together with Valentinov, he disappeared, once more abroad. After this came recollections that were purely personal, unbidden recollections of no use to him, starvation, arrest, and so forth, and suddenly, legal exile, blessed expulsion, the clean yellow deck, the Baltic breeze, the discussion with Professor Vasilenko over the, Im over the immortality of the soul. Out of all this, out of all this crude mishmash that struck to the pin and tumbled out of every corner of his memory, 
Degrading every recollection and blocking the way for free thought, he was unavoidably compelled to extract, carefully piece by piece, and admit whole to this book. Valentinov, a man of undoubted talent, as he was characterized by those who were about to say something nasty about him, an odd fellow, a jack-of-all-trades, an indispensable man for the organization of amateur shows, engineer, superb mathematician, chess and checkers enthusiast, enthusiast, and the amusingest gentleman, in the words of his own recommendation. He had wonderful brown eyes and an extraordinarily attractive calf. On his index finger, he wore a death's head ring, and he gave one to understand that there had been duels in his life. At one time, he had taught calisthenics in Little Lucian School, and pupils and teachers alike had been much impressed by the fact that a mysterious lady used to comfort to used to come for him in a limousine. He invented a passing, an amazing metallic pavement that was tried in St. Petersburg on the Nevsky near Kazan Cathedral. He had composed several clever chess problems and was the first exponent of the so-called Russian theme. He was 28 the year war was declared and suffered from no illness. The anemic word deserter somehow did not suit this cheerful, sturdy, agile man. No other word, however, could be found for it. What he did abroad during the war remained unknown. And so Lucian, the writer, decided to utilize him in full. Thanks to his presence, any story acquired extraordinary liveliness, a smack of adventure, but the most important part still remained to be invented. Everything he had up to now was the coloration, warm and vivid, on doubt, but floating in separate spots. He had still to find a definite design, a sharp line. For the first time, the writer Lucian had involuntarily begun with the colors. And the brighter these colors became in his mind, the hotter it was to sit down at the typewriter. A month went by, another, the summer began, and still he continued to clothe his yet invisible theme in the most festive hues. Sometimes it seemed to him that the book was already written, and he clearly saw the setup type, the galley proof skulls, scrolls, and the red hieroglyphs in the margin. And then the advanced copy, so fresh and crisp to the touch, and beyond that was a marvelous mist, a delectable rewards for all his failures, for all the fickleness of fame. He visited his numerous acquaintances, and lengthily, with great gusto, spoke of his coming book. One emigre newspaper printed a note to the effect that after a long silence, he was working on a new tale. And this note, which he himself had written and sent in, he excitedly read over three times and then cut out and placed in his wallet. He began to appear with greater frequency at literary evenings, and he supposed that everyone must be looking at him with curiosity and respect. Once on a treacherous summer day, he went to a suburban wood, got soaked in a sudden downpour while vainly looking for bullets, and the following day took to his bed. He ailed briefly and lonesomely, and his end was not pacific. The board of the Union of Immigre Writers honored his memory with a minute of silence. Okay, so that was... So now his father has ceased to be in the book. Um... I want to quickly go drink something. It's been, I think, a little while since I had something to drink. And we are now this far in the book. So I will come back. Hmm. I will come right back. I will. There are large 
I didn't mean large sounds. I was going to say there are large sounds, but that didn't make sense. There are loud sounds outside of my window. I don't know what they are. So I closed the window and locked it to kind of keep that um, from being loud. Since I don't know what that is. Um, whoa! I just knocked a skate over. There we go. I will come right back. I just... Oh, I need to plug in the phone for charging. Forgot to do that. It's been off. Well, I don't need to, but I'm going to. There we go. And I'll come back.
Black eyed peas warmed. No spices. Mm. Just simple black eyed peas. I will I will sit here since this gives a little bit of distance whereas if I were to stand there and continue to eat it would possibly be a little bit too close. Um. I'm just going to eat these beans first.
<laughs> it was some um, black eyed peas and some more water. You are using all caps again. Um, so, boy with a thorn in his side. What Pookie was saying earlier was that if a person uses all caps enough, it can trigger a filter of some kind where they can't see other people or something? I don't know. Hmm. August has seen his comments before, and so has, um, so has El Palaco. Six. Everything will be spilled, that's certain, said Lucian, again taking possession of the handbag. She quickly stretched forth her hand and moved her handbag farther away, banging it down on the table as if thereby to underline the interdiction. You always have to fiddle with something, she said amicably. Lucian looked at his hand, splaying the fingers and then closing them up again. The nails, tawny with nicotine, had ragged cuticles around them. Fat little furrows ran across the finger joints and a few hairs grew lower down. He placed his hand on the table next to her hand, milky, pale, and soft to look at, with short, neatly trimmed nails. I regret not having known your father, she said after a pause. He must have been very kind, very earnest, and very fond of you. Lucian was silent. Tell me some more. How was your life here? Were you really a little boy once, running and romping about? He replaced both hands on his cane, and from the expression on his face, from the sleepy lowering of his heavy lids, and from his slightly open mouth, looking as if he were about to yawn, she concluded that he had grown bored, and that he was tired of, mis of reminiscing. And anyway, he reminisced coldly. She was puzzled that having lost his father only a month ago, he was now able to look dry-eyed at the hotel where they had lived together during his boyhood. But even in this indifference, in his clumsy words, and in the cumbrous stirrings of his soul that seemed to be drowsily turning over and falling asleep again, she fancied she saw something pathetic. A charm that was difficult to define, but one that she had felt in him from the first day of their acquaintance, and how mysterious it was that despite the evident tepidity of his relationship with his father, he had chosen precisely this resort and precisely this hotel, as if expecting to receive from these once-seen objects and landscapes the tingle he was unable to experience without outside assistance. And he had arrived magnificently on a gray and green day in a drizzling rain, wearing a disgraceful black shaggy hat and huge rubbers, and looking through the window at his figure as he clambered ponderously out of the hotel bus. She had felt that this unknown newcomer 
was someone quite special. Unlike any other resident at the resort, that same evening she learned who he was. Everybody in the restaurant looked at this stout, gloomy man who ate greedily and sloppily and sometimes became lost in thought, one finger stroking the tablecloth. She did not play chess, took no interest in chess tournaments, but somehow or other his name was familiar to her. It had unconsciously imprinted itself in her memory, though she was unable to recall when she had first heard it. A German manufacturer who was a long-time sufferer from constipation and liked to talk about it, a man with a one-track mind, but who was good-natured and pleasant and dressed with some taste, suddenly forgot his constipation, and in the gallery, where they were drinking the curative water, informed her of several amazing facts about the gloomy gentleman who now, having exchanged his shaggy fedora for an old boater, was standing before a small display window let into one of the columns and examining some handcrafted knickknacks that were being exhibited for sale. Your fellow countryman, said the manufacturer, indicating him with a jerk of the, of the eyebrow, is a famous chess player. He has come from Paris for the tournament that will be held in Berlin in two months' time. If he wins, he'll challenge the world champion. His father recently died. It's all here in the newspaper. She wanted to make his acquaintance talk Russian. So attractive did he seem to her, with his uncouthness, his gloominess, and his low, turned-down collar, which for some reason made him look like a musician. And she was pleased that he did not take any notice of her and seek an excuse to talk to her, as did all of the other single men in the hotel. She was not particularly pretty. There is something lacking in her small, regular features, as if the last decisive jog that would have made her beautiful, leaving her features the same but endowing them with ineffable significance, had not been given them by nature. But she was twenty-five, her fashionably bobbed hair was neat and lovely, and she had one turn of the head which betrayed a hint of possible harmony, a promise of real beauty that at the last moment remained unfulfilled. She wore extremely simple and extremely well-cut dresses that left her arms and neck bare, as if she were flaunting a little their tender freshness. She was rich. Her father had lost a fortune in Russia and made another in Germany. Her mother was due soon at the resort, and since the advent of Lucian, the thought of her fussy arrival had become unpleasant. She made his acquaintance on the third day after his arrival, made it the way they do in old novels or in the motion pictures. She drops a handkerchief and he picks it up, with the sole difference that they interchanged roles. Lucian was walking along a path in front of her and in succession shed a large checked handkerchief that was unusually dirty and had all sorts of pocket debris sticking to it, then a broken and crushed cigarette minus half of its contents, a nut, and a French franc. She gathered up only the handkerchief and the coin and walked on, slowly catching up with him and curiously awaiting some new loss. With the cane he carried in his right hand, Lucian touched in passing every tree trunk and every bench, while gripping in his pocket with his left until finally he stopped, turned out his coat pocket, shed another coin, and started to examine the large hole in the lining. Right through, he said in German, taking the handkerchief from her hand. This also, she said in Russian. Poor material, he continued without looking. Neither switching to Russian nor showing any surprise, as if the return of his things had been quite natural. Oh, don't put them back there, she said with a sudden peal of laughter. Only then did he lift his head and glance not morosely at her. One moment, I have to come back a moment.
Um, the boy with a thorn in his side, I went out and I came back. Um, I can send you screenshots if you want of the things that that he said. I am not making it up. I'm not making up what he said. Um, I would not do that. So I'm going to continue. Poor material. He continued without looking up, neither switching to Russian nor showing any surprise as if the return of his things had been quite natural. Oh, don't put them back there, she said with a sudden peal of laughter. Only then did he lift his head and glance morosely at her. His puffy gray face with its badly shaven razor-nicked cheeks acquired a strange expression of bewilderment. He had wonderful eyes. They were narrow, even slightly slanting, and as if sprinkled with dust under their drooping lids, but through that fluffy dust there showed a moist bluish gleam containing something insane and attractive. Don't drop them again, she said and walked away, feeling his glance on her back. That evening as she entered the restaurant, she could not help smiling at him from afar. And he responded with the same gloomy, crooked half-smile he sometimes bestowed on the hotel cat as it slipped noiselessly along the floor from one table to another. And on the following day, in the hotel garden, among the grottoes, fountains, and earthenware dwarfs, he went up to her and began in his deep and melancholy voice to thank her for the handkerchief and the coin. And from that time, dimly and almost unconsciously, he constantly watched to see whether she would drop anything, as if to reestablish some secret symmetry. Don't mention it, don't mention it, she replied, and added many similar words. The poor relations of real words, and how many there are of them, these little throwaway words that are spoken hurriedly and temporarily fill the void. Employing such words and feeling their petty vapidity, she asked him if he liked the resort. Was he there for long, and did he take the waters? He replied that he did, was for long, and took the waters. Then, fully aware of the stupidity of the question, but incapable of stopping herself, she asked how long he had been playing chess. He gave no answer, and turned away when she felt so embarrassed that she began to reel off a list of all the meteorolo meteorological indications for yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He continued silent, and she also fell silent. And then she began to rummage in her handbag, searching agonizingly for a topic and finding only a broken comb. Suddenly, he turned his face to her and said, 18 years, three months, and four days. For her, this was quite, sorry, for her, this was an exquisite relief, and furthermore, she was somehow flattered by the elaborate circumstantiality of his reply. Subsequently, however, she began to grow a little annoyed that he was 
but he in his turn never asked any questions. Taking her, as it were, for granted. <laughs> An artist, a great artist, she frequently thought, contemplating his heavy profile, his corpulent hunched body, the dark lock of hair clinging to his always moist forehead, and perhaps it was precisely because she knew nothing at all about chess and that chess for her was not simply a parlor game or a pleasant pastime, but a mysterious art equal to all the recognized arts. She had never been in close contact with such people. There was no one to compare him with except those inspired eccentrics, musicians, and poets whose image one knows as clearly and as vaguely as that of a Roman emperor, an inquisitor, or a comedy miser. Her memory contained a modest, dimly lit gallery with a sequence of all the people who had, in a way, caught her fancy. Here were her school reminiscences, the girls' school in St. Petersburg with an unusual bit of ivy in its frontage that ran along a short, dusty, tramless street, and the geography teacher, who also taught in a boys' school, a large-eyed man with very white forehead and tousled hair, suffering, they said, from tuberculosis, once a guest, they said, of the Dalai Lama, in love, they said, with one of the upper form girls, a niece of the white-haired, blue-eyed headmistress, whose tidy little office was so cozy with its blue wallpaper and white Dutch stove. And it was precisely on a blue background, surrounded by blue air, that the geography teacher had remained in her memory. He would dash noisily into the classroom in his usual impulsive manner and then melt away and vanish, yielding his palace, sorry, yielding his place to another person who also seemed to her unlike all the rest. The appearance of this person was preceded by lengthy admonitions on the part of the headmistress not to laugh, not on any account to laugh. This was the first year of the Soviet regime. Out of 40 pupils in the class, only 17 remained, and every day they met the teachers with the question, will there be lessons today? And the latter invariably replied, we still haven't received final instructions. The headmistress ordered there to be no giggles when the man came from the commissariat for popular education, whatever he might say and however he might behave himself, and he came and took up his abode in her memory as extraordinarily amusing person, a visitor from a different, absurd world. He was lame but very lively and squirmy with quick, flickering eyes. The girls were crowded in the hushed hall, and he walked back and forth in front of them, limping briskly and turning with simian agility. And as he limped past them, nimbly dragging his foot on its double heel and with his right hand, cutting the air up into regular slices or else smoothing it out like cloth, he spoke swiftly and at length about the lectures in sociology he would be giving and about an imminent merger with the boys' school. A restrained laughter made one's jaws ache and caused spasms in one's throat. And later in Finland, which had remained in her heart as something more Russian than Russia, perhaps because the wooden villa and the fir trees and the white boat on the lake, black with the reflected conifers, were especially Russian, being treasured as something forbidden on the far side of the frontier. In this Finland, which was still vacation land, still part of St. Petersburg life, she saw several times from afar a celebrated writer, a very pale man with a very conspicuous goatee who kept glancing up at the sky, which enemy airplanes had begun to haunt, and he remained in some strange manner. Beside the Russian officer, who subsequently lost an arm in the Crimea during the Civil War, a most shy and retiring boy with whom she used to play tennis in summer and ski in winter. And with this snowy recollection, there would float up once more, against a background of night, the celebrated writer's villa, in which he later died. And the cleared path and the snow 
drifts illuminated by electric light, phantasmal stripes on the dark snow. These men, with their various occupations, each of whom tinted her recollection with his own particular color, blue geographer, khaki commissar, the writer's black overcoat and a youth all in white lobbing a fur cone with his tennis racket, were followed by glinting and dissolving images, in the gray life in Berlin, charity balls, monarchist meetings, and lots of identical people. All this was still clo so close that her memory was unable to focus properly and sort out what was valuable and what rubbish. And moreover, there was no time now to sort it out. Too much space had been taken up by this taciturn, fabulous, enigmatical man, the most attractive of all the men she had known. His very art and all the manifestations and signs of his art were mysterious. She quickly learned that in the evenings after supper he worked until late at night, but this work was beyond the powers of her imagination since there was nothing to link it to, neither an easel or a piano, and it was just such a definite emblem of art that her thoughts reached out for. His room was on the first floor, and men with cigars strolling in the darkness of the garden sometimes glimpsed his lamp and his inclined face. Somebody told her, finally, that he sat in an empty chessboard. She wanted to look for herself, and one night, soon after their first conversation, she made her way along the footpath between the oleander bushes to his window. But feeling a sudden awkwardness, she went straight by without looking and came out into the avenue where she could hear music coming from the cursal, and then, unable to master her curiosity, she went back again to the window, but this time deliberately making the gravel creak so as to convince herself she was not spying. His window was open, the blind unlowered, and in the bright depth of the room, she saw him take off his jacket, tense his neck muscles, and yawn. And in the slow, massive motion of his shoulder, the image of which continued to heave and turn before her eyes as she hastily walked away in the darkness toward the illuminated terrace of the hotel, she fancied the presence of a mighty fatigue after undivulged but surely miraculous labors. Lucian was indeed tired. Lately he had been playing too frequently, and too unsystematically. He was particularly fatigued by playing blind, a rather well-paid performance that he willingly gave. He found therein deep enjoyment. One did not have to deal with visible, inaudible, visible, audible, palpable pieces whose quaint shape and wooden materiality always disturbed him and always seemed to him but the crude mortal shell of, exist, of exquisite invisible chess forces. When playing blind, he was able to sense these diverse forces in their original purity. He saw then neither the knight's carved mane nor the glossy heads of the pawns, but he felt quite clearly that this or that imaginary square was occupied by a definite concentrated force, so that he envisioned the movement of a piece as a discharge, a shock, a stroke of lightning. and the whole chess field quivered through tension, and over this tension he was sovereign, here gathering in, and there releasing electric power. Thus he played against 15, 20, 30 opponents, and of course the sheer number of boards told, since it affected the actual playing time, but this physical weariness was nothing compared to the mental fatigue. Retribution for the stress and rapture involved in the game itself, which he conducted in a celestial dimension, where his tools were incorporeal quantities. He also found a certain solace in these blind games and the victories they afforded him, for in recent years he had been having no luck at international tournaments. A ghostly barrier had arisen that kept preventing him from coming first. Valentinov had happened to foretell this in the past, shortly before they parted. Shine while you can, he had said after that unforgettable tournament in London, the first after the war when the 20-year-old Russian player came out the victor. "'While well, you can,' repeated Valentinov slyly, "'because you won't be a boy prodigy much longer.' And this was very important for Valentinov. 
He was interested in Lucian only inasmuch as he remained a freak, an odd phenomenon, somewhat deformed but enchanting, like a dachshund's crooked legs. During the whole time that he lived with Lucian, he unremittingly encouraged and developed his gift, not bothering for a second about Lucian as a person whom it seemed not only Valentino but life itself had overlooked. He showed him no sorry, he showed him to wealthy people as an amusing monster, acquired useful contacts through him, and organized innumerable tournaments, and only when he began to suspect that the prodigy was turning simply into a young chess player did he bring him back to his father in Russia, and afterwards, like a kind of valuable, he took him away again when he thought that perhaps he had made a mistake, that the freak still had a year or two left in him. When even this span had run out, he made a gift to Lucian of some money, the one does to a mistress one has tired of and disappeared, finding fresh amusement in the movie business, that mysterious astrological business where they read scripts and look for stars, look for stars, and having departed to the sphere of jaunty, quick-talking, self-important conmen with their patter about the philosophy of the screen, the taste of the masses, and the intimacy of the movie camera, and with pretty good incomes at the same time, he dropped out of Lucian's world, for which Lucian was a relief, that odd kind of relief you get in resolving an unhappy love affair. He had become attached to Valentinov immediately, as early as the days of his chess tours in Russia, and later he regarded him the way a son might, a frivolous, coldish, elusive father, to whom one could never say how much one loved them. Valentinov was interested in him only as a chess player. At times he had about him something of the trainer who hovers about an athlete establishing a definite regime of merciless severity. Thus Valentinov asserted that it was all right for a chess player to smoke, since there was in both chess and smoking a touch of the East, but not in any circumstances to drink, and during their life together in the dining rooms of large hotels, enormous hotels, deserted in wartime, in chance restaurants, in Swiss inns and Italian trattori, he began invariably ordered mineral water for the young Lucian. The food he chose for him was light so that his brain could function freely, but for some reason, perhaps also because of a hazy connection with the East, he encouraged Lucian a great deal in his passion for sweets. Finally, he had a peculiar theory that the development of Lucian's gift for chess was connected with the development of the sexual urge, that with him, chess represented a special deflection of this urge, and fearing lest Lucian should squander his precious power in releasing by natural means the beneficial inner tension, he kept him at a distance from women and rejoiced over his chaste moroseness. There was something degrading in all this. Lucian, recalling that time, was surprised to note that not a single kind of main word had passed between him and Valentinov. Nevertheless, when three years after their final departure from Russia, that land which had grown so unpleasant, Valentinov had vanished. He experienced a feeling of emptiness, a lack of support, and then he acknowledged the inevitability of what had happened, sighed, turned around, and again was lost in thought over the chessboard. After the war, tournaments began to increase. He played in Manchester, where the decrepit champion of England forced a draw after a two-day struggle. In Amsterdam, where he lost the deciding game because he exceeded the time limit and his opponent, with an excited grunt, banked down the stop of Lucian's clock. In Rome, where Turati triumphantly unleashed his celebrated debut, and in many other cities, which for him were all identical, hotel, taxi, a hall at a cafe or club, these cities, these regular rows of blurry lamps marching past and suddenly advancing and encircling a stone horse in a square, were as much a habitual and unnecessary integument as the wooden pieces in the black and white board and he accepted this external life as something inevitable but, but completely uninteresting. Similarly, in his way of dressing and in the manner of his everyday life, he was prompted by extremely dim motives, stopping to think about nothing, barely changing his linen. 
automatically winding his watch at night, shaving with the same safety blade until it ceased to cut altogether, and feeding haphazardly and plainly. For some kind of melancholy inertia, he continued to order at dinner the same mineral water, which effervesced slightly in his sinuses and evoked a tickling sensation in the corners of his eyes, like tears for the vanished Valentinov. Only rarely did he notice his own existence when, for example, lack of breath, the revenge of a heavy body forced him to halt with open mouth on a staircase, or when he had a toothache, or when at a late hour during his chest cogitations in an outstretched hand, shaking a matchbox failed to evoke in it the rattle of matches, and the cigarette that seemed to have been thrust unnoticed into his mouth by someone else suddenly grew and asserted itself, solid, soulless, and static, and his whole life became concentrated in the single desire to smoke, although goodness knows how many cigarettes had already been unconsciously consumed. In general, life around him was so opaque and demanded so little effort of him that sometimes seemed someone, a mysterious invisible manager, continued to take him from tournament to tournament, but occasionally there were odd moments, such quietness all around, and when you looked out into the corridor, shoes, 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 standing at all the doors and in your ears the roar of loneliness. When his father was still alive, Lucian used to think with a sinking feeling about his arrival in Berlin, about the necessity of seeing his father helping him, talking to him, and this cheerful-looking old man in his knitted waistcoat, clapping him clumsily on the shoulder, was intolerable to him, like the shameful recollection that you try to throw off, screwing up your eyes and moaning through your teeth. He did not come from Paris for his father's funeral, fearing, above all, corpses, coffins, wreaths, and the responsibility connected with all this. But he came later, set off for the cemetery, Tramped around in the rain among the graves in mud-caked rubbers, failed to find his father's grave and behind some, sea some trees, caught sight of a man who was probably the caretaker, but a strange feeling of inertia and shyness prevented him from inquiring. He raised his collar and plodded back over a patch of waste ground towards the waiting taxi. His father's death did not interrupt his work. He was getting ready for the Berlin tournament with the definite idea of finding the best defense against the complex opening of the Italian Tarati, who is the most awesome player, a representative of the latest fashions in chess, opened the game by moving up on the flanks, leaving the middle of the board unoccupied by pawns, but exercising a most dangerous influence on the center from the sides. Scorning the cozy safety of castling, he strove to create the most unexpected and whimsical interrelations between his men. Lucian had already met him once and lost. And this defeat, particularly ranked because Tarati, by temperament, by his style of play, and by his productivity, sorry, proclivity for fantastic arrayals, was a player with a kindred mentality to his own. Only Tarati had gone farther, further. Lucian's game, which in his early youth had so astounded the experts with its unprecedented boldness and disregard for the basic, as it seemed, rules of chess, now appeared just a little old-fashioned compared to, with the glittering extremism of Tarati. Lucian's present plight was that of a writer or composer who, having assimilated the latest things in art at the beginnings of his active career, caused a temporary sensation with the originality of his devices, all at once notices that a change has imperceptibly taken place around him, that others, sprung from goodness knows where, have left behind in the very devices where he recently led the way, and then he feels himself robbed, sees only ungrateful imitators and the bold artists who have overtaken him, and seldom understands that he himself is to blame. He who has petrified in his art, which was once new, but has not advanced since then. Looking back over eighteen and more years of chess, Lucian saw an accumulation of victories at the beginning, and then a strange lull, bursts of victories, here and there, but in general, irritating and hopeless draws, thanks to which he imperceptibly earned the reputation of a cautious, impenetrable, prosaic player. And this was strange. The bolder his imagination, the livelier his invention during the secret work between matches, the more oppressive became his feeling of helplessness when the contest began, and the more timidly and circumspectly he played. 
having long ago entered the ranks of international grandmasters, extremely well-known, cited in all chess textbooks, a candidate among five or six others with the title of world champion. He owed this flattering reputation to his early performances, which had left around him a kind of indistinct light and the halo of the chosen, a haze of glory. His father's death presented itself to him as a landmark by which to measure the road he had traveled, and looking back he saw with something of a shudder how slowly he had been going of late, and having seen it he plunged with gloomy passion into new calculations, inventing it already vaguely, sensing the harmony of the moves he needed, a dazzling defense. He had been unwell that night in the Berlin Hotel after his trip to the cemetery. Palpitations of the heart and queer thoughts, and a feeling that his brain had gone numb and been varnished over, the doctor saw that in the morning advised him to take rest, to go to some quiet place where there is greenery all around, said the doctor, and Lucian, cancelling the promise to slay a blind chess, went away to the obvious place which had immediately loomed before him when the doctor referred to greenery. In fact, he felt dimly grateful to an obliging memory that indicated the necessary resort to so aptly, took all the trouble on itself and put him into a ready-made, ready-waiting hotel. He did feel better amidst this green scenery that was moderately beautiful and transmitted a feeling of security and tranquility. And suddenly, as if in a fairground booth when a printed paper screen is burst starwise, admitting a smiling human face, there appeared no one knew where a person who was so unexpected and so familiar, and who spoke with a voice that seemed to have been sounding mutely all his life and now had suddenly burst through the usual murk. Trying to unravel in his mind this impression of something very familiar he recalled quite irrelevantly, but with stunning clarity the face of a bare-shouldered, black-stockinged young prostitute standing in the lighted doorway in a dark street in a nameless town, and in some ridiculous way it seemed to him that this was she, that she had come now, primly dressed and somewhat less pretty, as if she had washed off some bewitching makeup, but because of this had become more accessible. This was his first impression when he saw her, when he noticed with surprise that he was actually talking to her. It irked him a little that she was not quite as good-looking as she might have been, judging by odd, dreamy signs strewn about in his past. He reconciled himself to this and gradually began to forget her vague prototypes, and then he felt reassured and proud that here talking to him, spending her time with him and smiling at him, was a real live person. And that day on the garden terrace, where bright yellow wasps kept settling on the iron tables and moving their lowered antennae, that day when he started to speak of how he had once lived in this hotel as a small boy, Lucian began with a series of quiet moves, the meaning of which he himself only vaguely sensed, his own peculiar declaration of love. Go on, tell me more, she repeated, ha despite having noticed how morosely and dully he had fallen silent. He sat leaning on his cane and thinking of that with a night's move of this lime tree standing on a sunlit slope, one could take that telegraph pole over there, and simultaneously he tried to remember what exactly he had just been talking about. A waiter with a dozen empty beer mugs hanging from his crooked fingers ran along the wing of the building, and Lucian remembered with relief that he had been speaking about the tournament that once took place in that very wing. He grew agitated and hot, and the band of his hat constricted his temples, and this agitation was not quite comprehensible yet. Let's go, he said. I'll show you. It must be empty there now, and cool. Stepping heavily and trailing his cane, which grated along the gravel and bounced against the doorstep, he entered the door first. How ill-bred he is, she reflected and caught herself shaking her head, then accused herself of introducing a slightly false note. His manners had nothing at all to do with ill-breeding. Here, I think it's this way, said Lucian, and pu pushed aside a door. 
A fire was burning. A fat man in white was shouting something, and a tower of plates ran past him on human legs. No, farther, said Lucian, and almost fell. Sorry, and walked along the corridor. He opened another door and almost fell. Steps going down and some shrubs at the bottom and a pile of rubbish and an apprehensive hen jerkily walking away. I made a mistake, said Lucian. It's probably here his hat, feeling burning beads of sweat gather on his brow. Oh, how clear was the image of that cool, empty, spacious hall and how difficult it was to find it. Just try this door here, he said. The door proved to be locked. He pressed the handle down several times. Who's there? A hoarse voice said abruptly, and a bed creaked. Mistake, mistake, muttered Lucian, and went further. Then he looked back and stopped. He was alone. Where was she? He said aloud, shuffling his feet, and he turned this way and that. Corridor, window giving on garden, gadget on wall, with numbered pigeonholes, a bell word. In one of the pigeonholes, a number popped up awry. He was bemused and troubled, as if he had lost his way in a bad dream. And he quickly walked back, repeating under his breath, queer jokes, queer jokes. He came out unexpectedly into the garden, and there were two characters who were sitting on the bench and looking at him curiously. Suddenly, he heard laughter overhead and raised his face. She was standing on the little balcony of her room and laughing. Her elbows popped on the railings, propped on the railings. Her palms pressed against her cheeks and shaking her head with sly reproachfulness. She looked at his ample face, the hat on the back of his head, and waited to see what he would do now. I couldn't keep up with you, she cried, straightening up and opening her arms in some kind of explanatory gesture. Lucian lowered his head and entered the building. She supposed that in a moment he would knock on her door, and she decided not to let him in and say the room was untidy, but he did not knock. When she went down to supper, he was not in the dining room. He's taken offense, she decided, and went to bed earlier than usual. In the morning, she went out for a walk and looked to see if he was waiting in the garden, reading his newspaper on a bench as usual. He was not in the garden. He was not in the gallery. And she went for a walk without him. When he did not appear for dinner and his table was taken by an ancient couple who had long had their eye on it, she asked in the office if Mr. Lucian was sick. Mr. Lucian left this morning for Berlin, replied the girl. An hour later, his baggage returned to the hotel. The janitor and a bellboy, with the matter of fact indifference, carried in the bags which that morning they had carried out. Lucian was returning from the station on foot, a stout, doleful gentleman, crushed by the heat and in shoes wiped up with dust. He rested on all the benches and once or twice plucked a blackberry, grimacing from the sourness. While walking along the highway, he noticed a fair-haired small boy following him with tiny steps, holding an empty beer bottle in his hands and lagging behind on purpose and staring at him with unbearable childish concentration. Lucian halted. The boy also halted. Lucian moved. The boy moved. Then Lucian lost his temper and threatened him with his cane. The other froze, grinning with surprise and joy. I'll, said Lucian in a deep voice and went toward him, his cane raised. The small boy jumped and ran off. Grumbling to himself and breathing hard through the nose, Lucian continued on his way. All at once, an extremely well-aimed pebble hit him on the left shoulder blade. He let out a cry and turned around. Nobody. An empty road, woods. I'll kill him, he said loudly in German and walked on faster, trying to weave from side to side the way. He had read somewhere men do when they fear a shot in the back and repeating his helpless threat. He was quite exhausted, panting and almost crying by the time he reached the hotel. Change my mind, he said, addressing the office grill as he went by. I'm staying. Change my mind. She's sure to be in her room, he said as he went up to the stairs. He burst in upon her as if he had butted the door with his hand, sorry, with his head, and dimly catching sight of her reclining in a pink dress on the couch, he said hastily, Hello, hello, and strode all around the room, supposing that everything was working out very easily, wittily and entertainingly, and simultaneously suffocating with excitement. And therefore, in continuance of the above, I have to inform you that you will be my wife. I implore you to agree with this. It was absolutely impossible to go away. Now everything will be different and wonderful. 
and at this point he settled on a chair by the radiator and covering his face with his hands burst into tears and then trying to spread one hand so that it covered his face he began with the other to search for his handkerchief and through the trembling wet chinks between his fingers he perceived in duplicate a blurry pink dress that noisily moved toward him now now that's enough that's enough she repeated in a soothing voice a grown man and crying like that he seized her by the elbow and kissed something hard and cold her wristwatch she moved his straw hat and stroked his forehead and swiftly retreated evading his clumsy grabbing movements Lucian trumpeted into his handkerchief once, once more, loudly and juicily. Then he wiped his eyes, cheeks, and mouth, and sighed with relief, leaning on the radiator, his moist, bright eyes looking in front of him. It was then that he, she realized clearly that this man, whether you liked him or not, was not one you could thrust out of your life. That he had sat himself down firmly, solidly, and apparently for a long time. But she also wondered how she could show this man to her father and mother. How could he be visualized in their drawing room? A man of a different dimension, with a particular form and coloring that was compatible with nothing and no one. At first she tried fitting him this way and that in her family, among their milieu and even among the furnishings of their flat. She made an imaginary illusion enter the rooms, talk with their mother, eat home-cooked kulabiaka, and be reflected in the sumptuous samovar purchased abroad. And these imaginary calls ended with a monstrous catastrophe. Lucian, with a clumsy motion of his shoulder, would knock the house down like a shaky piece of scenery that emitted a sigh of dust. Their apartment was an expensive, well-appointed one, on the first floor of an enormous Berlin apartment house. Her parents, rich once more, had decided to start living in a strict Russian style, which they somehow associated with ornamental Slavic scriptory. Postcards depicting sorrowing boyar maidens, varnished boxes bearing gaudy pyrographers of troikas and firebirds, and the admirably produced, long-since-expired art magazines and containing such wonderful photographs of old Russian manners and porcelain. Her father used to say to his friends that it was particularly pleasant after business meetings and conversations with people of dubious origin to immerse himself in genuine Russian comfort and eat genuine Russian food. Okay, I'm going to put the bookmark in this, and I will be right back. Right back. Okay. Six hours.
pages. Oh, so 156. Um, At one time, their servant had been a genuine Russian orderly taken from an immigrant shelter near Berlin. Oh, I'm not sad. <laughs> I am just feeling slightly, um... Strange. <laughs> I don't know what it is. I don't know what I'm thinking of. Um, so maybe I should take a break here. If that's all right. Um, and I think maybe I should start a new stream so that we could continue um, reading the book um, after I rest my voice for a little while, um, but I could rest my voice and we could still, um, do something else in the meantime. So I think I'm going to start another, um, stream and I will share the link in this one. And that stream will be some sort of activity while I rest my voice. Because I think it could be just my voice is getting tired, I guess, maybe. Like I started feeling really thirsty. So I think I'm going to, to rest my voice, but we can continue the party. So for like maybe... Um, maybe a little while of resting it. Okay. Thank you for listening so far. I feel like... Um... Even though we are almost halfway through the book, it could take another I feel like it could take maybe nine hours more to actually finish this book, which is not a bad thing. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, well, I'm going to start a new stream. And when I go back to reading that, I will just start a stream for reading that the rest of the way. Okay. <laughs>